Thank you, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to have a moment of silence for the victims of Paris. Thank you. Um, we're going to start tonight. I'm not going to open the board's meeting yet because we have county, so I'll turn the, the meeting over to Tobias, who is the chair of the county. Thank you, Mr. DaCosta. Um, announcements. Um, this county commissioner's meet meeting and the board of selectmen meeting is being um, recorded via video and audio. Um, public comment. I don't see any. Uh, new business. I'm not aware of any board members. Um, approval of minutes, warrants, and pending contracts. Um, pardon me, I have a little bit of a cold today. Um, minutes, any thoughts, anyone? Look fine to me. Really short. Without any ado, those will be approved. And we have one um, grant from the Commonwealth, and our town administrator might be able to take us through that. Hopefully, our director of planning will take us through that. Is, is he here? This is the, yeah, I. You mean, wait, what? Are you talking about item number one under public hearings? Yes. Yeah, the grant of easement? Uh, I you would defer to the Attorney Brusher. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, Libby. I had a, there was a grant in here, no, um, agreement with the county. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, I have one in front of me that says, um, Mr. Trudeau with the planning board request of acceptance of a grant, non exclusive. Mr. Usher. You missed payroll and treasury. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I'd like to approve the treasury and payroll warrants. So moved. All right. Mr. Brescher. And I'd like to open the public me meeting. Thank you. Good evening. For the applicant, uh, it's Attorney John Brescher representing John F. Trudell, the owner of 16, excuse me, I apologize, of 12 Nobody or Farm Road, um, better known as the Nantucket Trading Post. Um, <clears throat> what we have here is that my client can. Well, let me back up and say that in 1989 there was a grant of easement for the for a future um, bike path, and uh, all along this section, or not all along, but for properties 12, 6, 12, 14, and 16, nobody or farm road, a 20-foot uh, bike path easement was granted to the town, but never accepted. Um, my client, it was all vacant land at the time. My client constructs uh, this. This structure in 2006 goes through the necessary permitting, um, gets a survey, uh, and lo and behold, the survey does not show the 20-foot easement. Um, it simply shows the 10-foot setback. So he constructs it. He gets a certificate of occupancy. He is in the process of trying to sell, and lo and behold, a title report found that there is still a 20-foot easement on there, and his structure is approximately 10 feet into that 20-foot easement. Um, the, the sidewalk already exists. I have, um, so it's not, nothing, nothing's changing in that sense. And so we're before you tonight to request that the easement, uh, that basically my, my client will grant the town an easement along the 10 foot strip, which is in um, conjunction with and, and in harmony with uh, everywhere else on Nobody or Farm Road is only a 10 foot easement. <coughs> This easement was the 20 foot easement was granted in 1989. I think it was the first one on record. And if you look at a, an old plan from Jeff Blackwell, it's the only section that's 20 feet. Um, nonetheless, the, the bike path is already installed, the sidewalk is already there. Um, and so we're looking to sort of clean this up by requesting that the board grant this easement and uh, rather, my client grant the easement to the town and that the board accept it. I guess I have a question. Where, look, where will the ten foot be? Will it be in between the sidewalk and what should have been the easement? That's that's correct. That that's that would be the ten foot easement area, which is what's on the other properties up the road and down the road. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And so, what will happen if if a uh, if the bike path is built? 
Will it run along <coughs> next to the sidewalk? Like how will that? The, the bike path is already built. It's er, everything. Everything's it's already a, been constructed. It's a brick sidewalk now, yeah. Matt, and that section just was constructed in brick for some reason at the I, time. I, well, I understand it's brick, but that, so that's used mm -hmm. as the bike path, the walkway. Okay. Well, bike path on the other side. Bike path on the other side of the road. Crosses over there, by. It goes like behind small friends. Yeah, no, I know. It kind of loops I, I, I bike out there. I know how it goes. But I'm, I'm assuming when they did this that they ran. Did they run it down the rest of the road to have a bike path on that side? Or? That, that's right. Uh, every going south, there is an easement. There's a 10 foot easement going almost to Old South Road. Not not quite. See what I'm almost saying? around so, like Teasdale. Yeah. So certain. we want to make sure. I just I'm double checking that we yeah. aren't expunging that. If at some point we want to run an easement, run a bike path on the opposite side of the street. Well, no, we, we still have. The, we'll, we'll be able to do it. Yeah, he's just trying. What he's trying to do is conform to what all the other properties have, which is, I think, that, I that's a, that's exactly right. So everybody else has ten. For some reason, this property had twenty. That's right. It, it was never recorded, or what? It, it was recorded, but it was never formally accepted by the town. That's why mm -hmm. he missed. He missed it on the title <coughs> search the first time. It, I don't. I'm not sure why the survey didn't pick it up the first time, but or or anyone else did. But he has got a four-footed building in it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Just, just about to, to follow up on Bobby's point, if you did a title search, would you find that initial grant of 20 feet recorded in the, the in in the records? The grant, the, yes, but not the acceptance. But not the I understand, not the acceptance. So the grant, do you have to expunge that grant as part of this process I and accept the new and have a new grant, or is the I mean the 20 feet is there? I, s I spoke with uh, Ed Williams, the chief title examiner over mm -hmm. at the land court about this because it's registered land, and he said that no action needs to be taken to expunge the existing easement by simply having my client grant the, the county this new easement and you accept it, it takes the place okay. of, the, of the old easement. Okay. Should I make a motion, Mr. Chairman? Okay, well, so just a, I'm, 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 I, I, my only thing is, 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 are we? Is this going to? I guess is it going to run? Yeah, you know, we're going to take the ten that includes the brick walkway. Is the property adjacent have it behind again? Is this? Are they going to match up? They. I, you see my point? I, 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 I see your I see your point, and I've been in touch with uh, the attorney for uh, it's. This is twelve, and it goes fourteen is yeah. lower, and then sixteen. Yeah. I've been in touch with. That attorney and we are we're working that out. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a ten foot one in the future. Yeah, because ten foot adjacent. Yeah, so exactly. The, so everyone so, will push so it. So everyone it's all will push matches it up. up. That's right. Is what will probably end up happening. Yeah. Okay. We're still in public hearing. Any other questions? Any comments from the public? This is a public hearing. <laughs> Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Yeah, close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. And one other question: Why did we not? Why is the town did we not accept it? Or the county? Or county? Actually, why yeah. is the county? What What would be the mechanism whereby we wouldn't have accepted it? Back, it, it was back in 1989, and there are a lot of these out there where it might have been sort of lax title standards. Who would say yes, we'll gr we'll grant you the easement, and the town. Uh, I think it was until 1999. I want to say the town and county had to. Oh, accept easements via town meeting. Thereafter, it's been been authorized for the county commissioners and board of selectmen to do so. Um, why it was never done, I'm yeah. I'm not sure. Um, but there are I'm, I know that there are others out there. Well, this well, I guess will something like this sneak through the cracks again now? I guess it's for Libya. I think we have a lot tighter control on this yeah. now and better okay. communication between the the groups that are like the planning board that are requiring these as part of their approvals and us. Yeah, okay. A absolutely. I mean, I think when this when this easement <coughs> was initially granted, I'm not sure there was ever even a, a plan at the time for a bike path. They just mm. sort of as a gesture of goodwill, s somebody said, oh, sure, we'll, get, we'll give you 20 feet. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the easement. I'll Good. second it. Second all in favor? Aye. 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 And that's a 10-foot easement, just for clarity. Yes. To just one more sort of follow-up on the process, Libby. So who, who actually, f you know, files the easement? Who takes the piece of paper? Does the town? That would be us. 
but yet the acceptance is ours. So what, do we give you a piece of paper that you take down? Yes, that, that's correct. So what will happen is this document has a – basically uh, my client will sign and then the county will sign accepting right. it, and, and I'll go down and record it. Okay. Thanks. So, so just maybe one more question, yeah. <laughs> because uh, we have a lot of examples around here of, um, as you said, John, and others have said over the years, of documents not being recorded. So we in the office, we're going to all sign this piece of paper, and Erica is going to make sure it gets delivered to you. How do we know you actually record it? Does, does a receipt come back to us that gets filed someplace? No. The reason I ask is that we do have um, other, for example, I recall takings from long ago that, that they were never perfected. And, you know, woe on us for not knowing they weren't perfected. And if you don't perfect it, how do we know you don't perfect it? I can assure you I will, I will bring I, I know, a, record, scouts a honor. recorded copy. Well, well, it's just something to think about because, you, you know, receipt or some acknowledgement might well, might in this complete case, the cycle. Been, this right one, uh, this one, it, it would not benefit the, the property owner not to record it. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Right, Rick. But I'm There's just no. Sort of I saying. mean, one, we approve them. They go to the client, and mm -hmm. we don't know what happens to them after that. Yeah. I guess we should probably make sure. Maybe we should keep a, a copy of it. I, we must, I we must keep, keep a, copy. a document copies. file. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. we have um, hard copies mm -hmm. that go. I. The, basically what the process is for all real estate that comes through me now is that um, I scan everything. I have an electronic copy. The hard copy goes to the planning office so that they can do whatever they do with it there. Um, and then I believe at some point it ends up coming back to our office to get filed permanently. At least that's been the newest. Back, back from where, process. Erica? Planning. And, um, John, when you take it down, do you get a receipt from the uh, the county deeds office that certifies you? Yes. Uh, what, what I get is I will get a I will get a receipt for the seventy five dollars. Yeah, cost for, for the price. filing. It, right, and and uh, maybe the day after we'll get the original copy back with the sort of registered mm -hmm. document mm -hmm. on it. Um, and I would say that most attorneys are pretty good about contacting me after the fact saying, hey, we're on record, right. or, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, in this case, it's not so critical, but, but if it was a takings and, you know, the attorney got busy and went off on vacation and it didn't get filed and we didn't know about it, it's more important. typically what? filed by the town the right. planning office. All right, well, we wouldn't really no, enough said. It's, it's good to uh, bring up questions about how these things move forward. Absolutely. Mr. Brasher, thank you. Thank you very much. With the closure of that item, we will move on to a public hearing to consider extending the Hummock Pond Road bicycle path. And to that, we will look to Mr. Burns to clue us in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to let the, uh, the county know, the commissioners know that the project is still on budget and on schedule. Uh, this is a, a public hearing to take any comments from the property owners uh, about the, the one of the last steps in the process, which is the right-of-way acquisitions that are necessary. Um, uh, I, I can go through those, but I just preface it by saying we, we, we've notified uh, owners on both sides of the road via certified mail. We followed that up with, with notices to uh, uh, the abutters on, on the project side of, of the roadway to get any type of comments, uh, concerns with the design. and. Um, those are going to be incorporated into the, uh, the the final design for construction. A lot of that includes removal and resetting of of privet um, and uh, cobblestone aprons and, and these kinds of things. Uh, although the project is on uh, schedule and on budget, there are a, a few little items that uh, that staff is recommending be uh, uh, done to ensure that that impacts to the properties are minimized and the safety of the uh, the users of the path is is maximized. Uh, staff is recommending a, a, a realigning uh, plus or minus 500 feet of, of roadway in front of uh, 70 Milk Street. Um, that work is going to be done within the bounds of the budget for the project. But again, this is another uh, um, effort to, uh, to to minimize damages to the properties while you know, maximizing the, the safety of the users. Uh, uh, we're also recommending as part of uh, 
damages to uh, to, to treat the the Prospecto Cemetery as as uh, at the same rate that the, uh, the the residential properties are uh, further up the street. So, uh, if there's no objection, stuff will go ahead and, and make that part of the damage award. And uh, regarding uh, any type of archaeological work, uh, we've had some coordination uh, uh, with the Prospect Hill um, Cemetery. And although the state law doesn't require require locally funded projects to uh, uh, to go through. Um, uh, 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 an initial planning or a, a screening of the area uh, for archaeological work. Uh, we're going to try to be proactive and, and, and do that on a preliminary basis. Um, the law does require, if there are findings, that folks are contacted, police department is contacted, uh, Mass Historical uh, is contacted. Uh, but we are doing some uh, progressive work to, uh, to kind of cut that off at, at the earlier stages. Um, that said, the, uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, the county is to take uh, comments from the property owners who some of whom may be here, uh, but as far as action, the uh, this is part of a, a the right of way acquisition process. This is the first hearing on this. Uh, staff is requesting that the county schedule a final hearing to approve the order of taking along the uh, uh, for this project on January seventh. Uh, and property owners will be given a offer from the county uh, to include the damage awards that we talked about. Uh, they, they will need to get those 30 days prior to the January 7th hearing. So we're looking to have those out by the end of this week. Um, I guess the deadline would be December 7th, uh, but we'll try to get that out as soon as possible, those offers. Um, that said, uh, I'm, I'm sure there may be some of butters that uh, may have questions about the project. This is the forum to, to ask those and to answer those. If not, a uh, I, I asked that the county go ahead and schedule the, uh, the hearing for uh, January 7th so that we can finalize the right-of-way acquisition for the project and we can ensure the project's on schedule. Right. Just, Mike, bef before we take some public questions, I think it might be helpful. You know, this is an important project for the town. If you could kind of explain exactly what we're doing here. I think it would be helpful for the whole community. Absolutely. Uh, the, 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 milk, the extension of the Hummock Pond Road bike path uh, is, is uh, essentially an eight-foot path from the intersection of Hummock Pond Road along Milk Street, uh, from Hummock Pond Road to the intersection of Mount Vernon Street, which is uh, uh, in very close proximity to Prospect Street. So essentially link users uh, of the Hummock Pond Road bike path along Milk Street, along the southeast side to Prospect Street. Um, that facility that will be constructed uh, will abut the roadway and will consist of an eight-foot wide path uh, that will be used by pedestrians and bicyclists, again, so on the southeast side paved. of the road. It'll, it'll be It'll be a paved, paved path. Uh, and, and I should add that uh, part of the project is relocation of uh, some utility poles that the uh, utilities have offered to do. Um, that will be done uh, shortly after this right-of-way um, process is complete. Uh, but the work has uh, been uh, offered to be done uh, by the uh, utility companies and will uh, prevent any obstructions in the path itself if the poles were to stay on the other uh, southeast side of the road. And it also prevents any further impacts to the properties. Uh, so so, by the poles so by move, all the poles are going to move? You know, to the Correct. southerly side of the path. So, by relocating the poles to the opposite side of the road, uh, we minimize impact, further impacts to the property owners, and maximize safety of users by not locating the poles in the path. And then, my last question: Is there going to be a fence kind of separating these two, or is it going to be more similar to Madikett Road? Uh, very similar to Madikett Road. Uh, the, the there's a a, a slope curbing uh, separation uh, between the roadway and the and the path, uh, so there will not be a traditional six foot wide grass strip. Uh, with split rail fencing between the path and the roadway. The constrictions in the right-of-way just, just don't allow that. And with uh, a lot of the buildings uh, being set closer to the road uh, than further down Hummock Pond Road, uh, this, is, this is the option that's, that, that we can actually provide some facility for the users. So just on, on the same side, so the, the bike path will, if I heard you correctly, terminate at Mount Vernon? Correct. This is a public hearing. Any questions from the public? Comments? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and the pleasure of the board. Well, I'm sort of curious what we're supposed to do. This is a consideration if I read the agenda item. Mm -hmm. We move to have. And we, we move to what's finalize. The final, what's the motion you need here, Mike? Do you want to move to schedule that meeting, Bobby? Is move that to schedule a meeting for, dis, for January, January 7th. 7th. Correct. Um, and with that scheduling, you instruct staff to, to make all the preparations for the meeting, sending out notices to the abutters, making the offers that we discussed. Um, so we'll get that um, all set and ready to when go. When you for say instruct staff, you mean planning? 
uh, you guys planning, uh, Department of Public Works, uh, and, uh, and town administration. That I'm sure there'll be some coordination with using town council. It's January 6th. 6th. Correction. I make a motion that we uh, um, put this on our agenda for January 6th for final, final consideration. Is that correct? I'll second, second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, with that, any comments from the board members? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. Mr. DeCosta. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I saw about the hands go up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see him. Um, all right. That takes us back to the Board of Selectmen. I'm going to call the meeting to order for the November 18th um, Board of Selectmen. And first thing I'll do is accept the agenda. If there's no changes, we'll accept the agenda as written. Thank you, everyone. I'll turn it over to Libby for announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, this meeting is being audio and video recorded. The annual town meeting warrant for 2016 is currently open for citizen warrant article submissions. The closure is next Monday, the 23rd at 4 p.m. Articles should be submitted with the requisite number of signatures, which is 10 registered voters. People should think about getting more than that, just in case people aren't registered. And they are submitted to our office and or the town clerk's office. There is no board meeting next Wednesday. And town offices are closed next Thursday for Thanksgiving. The next board meeting will be December 2nd. And I, I wanted to mention, I don't know how interested people are or are not in this, but the scallop shell pile at Jetty's Beach has been relocated to the middle entrance, I guess we could call it, on Maticot Road. At the landfill. The at the, near, near the landfill, the next gate down from the landfill. I kind of miss it where it was, Libby, but I'll change with the times. Thank you. You're, you and one other person will miss it where it was. <laughs> I don't miss the smell when I go down. Whoever that might be. <laughs> I, I just had lots of fond memories as a child, dumping scallops there. Let me, quick question. Are there many uh, or any citizen articles? In I think we heard today yet? there are five. I haven't looked at them yet. Okay. Um, but on your December 2nd meeting, you have another discussion about 2016 warrant articles, so we could add the list to that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Libby. Uh, public comment. Is there anything, any, anyone who would like to make public comment on any item that is not on our agenda tonight? I don't see any hands coming up, so thank you. There is no new business. We'll move on to the approval of minutes, warrants, and pending contracts. I'll approve, uh, we'll ask your approval of the payroll warrants for the week ending November 8th. November 15th, with no objections, those will be approved. The approval of the Treasury warrants for November 11th and November 18th, 2015, no objections, those are approved. And approval of the pending contracts for November 18th, 2015 is set forth in the spreadsheet identified as Exhibit 1. Libby, we have a few on here today. Thank you. Yes, bear with me. There are quite a number, most for DPW. We have a grant agreement for town administration with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is an annual grant we received through the Mass Cultural Council. It's a $4,400 grant this year. And when we receive the funds, they are distributed through our local cultural council. We have a purchase agreement for GPW with Highway Safety Systems, Inc. It's a not-to-exceed $12,000 contract for the current fiscal year, and that's for road construction materials. We have a service agreement for GPW with Smokestack Lighting, Inc., $33,099, and that is for the installation and repair of lightning protection at the wastewater treatment facilities. We have a purchase agreement for GPW with Superior Industrial Products Corp. It's a not to exceed $30,000 contract over three years, and that is for the chemicals required for grease remediation for the sewer and pump stations. We have a service agreement for GPW with Pride Environmental, $59,354. That is for repair of the Pine Valley Pump Station. Service agreement for DPW with Anise Electrical Services, Inc. That is a not to exceed $100,000 over three-year contract. And that's for commercial and industrial electrical services for the treatment facilities and the pump stations. We have a supply agreement for DPW with Sherwin-Williams Paint, not to exceed $6,000 over one year, and that's, again, road construction materials. 
another supply agreement for GPW with PA Landers Inc., not to exceed $25,000 in one year, road construction materials again. We have a service agreement for Our Island Home with Donovan Building Corp., $176,000, and this is for the repair and replacement of the current facility's roof. Can't wait. We have a service agreement for DPW with Kashik Construction, $24,440, and that is for the repair and renovation of office space at the 20 South Water Street building. We are intending to do a little bit of interior work there so that we can move the NRTA office in there and, and free up space in the current One East Chestnut building for the health department. Gotcha. With no objections, the contracts will be approved. No question. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to citizens, citizen and departmental requests. The first item we have is a request for the approval of a change of manager from a seasonal malt wine, wine malt beverage in holder license at 19, 1709 Associates LLC DBAS Figs at 29 Fair from Tracy Root Manager to Seth High Manager for the premises located at 29 Fair. This was table from October 21st. Yeah, I thought we heard Mr. Root was the Shining star. most skillful manager and would be there for several years to come. Well, or something like that. <laughs> at least we'll have the person who's there acting as the manager be the manager. Wouldn't so that be nice? I would uh, entertain a motion from the board. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm abstaining. One abstention because you... It's not to yeah, that's right. The next item is the planning officer request for acceptance of a quick claim deed f from the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust Fund for lot 5F Bartlett Road and, the S and Surfside Road as shown on the plan of land entitled Plan of Land Number 2 Bartlett Road in Nantucket Island, Nantucket, Massachusetts, dated June 1, 2015. This is pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any questions on it? No, we've run over this several times, Bobby, so you want a motion to accept? I would love one. You got it. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. Thank you. The next is a request for a road name change from Pacamo Avenue to Waterview Drive. I don't can, can you really see the water? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Someone asked for this. Motions? I don't mind since there are other Pacamos, so, and so it helps it might be a little less confusion. confusing. So yeah. that's that's a good reason. All right. So I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to the public hearing part of tonight's meeting. The first public hearing. I'll open a public hearing to consider application to modify an existing entertainment license for Samson Row. Is that right? Sam Sorry. Salmon Row. Salmon Row. Thank you. DBA LLC, uh, LLC DBA as a Atlas Barbecue and Fish House. I'm gonna, I'm You're going to understand. Yeah. Okay. My understanding there may be some issues with this. Is that correct? Well, there was an issue raised in some of the material presented to us, and um, we may all, right. all have some questions too, Bobby. So. Um, Amy Baxter with the Police Department and Licensing Department. Um, yes, you have the comments from, I believe, Fire and Building and those right. issues. We did just have a discussion um, um, with Ms. Gould about this. And what we are asking for in this instance, we would like to work through some of these um, discussions and issues that were brought up. Um, they are also, just um, for reference, requesting for an annual liquor license that will be coming up in December at the December 16th meeting. They're working on going from a seasonal to an annual liquor license. So what we would like to do is um, two things. We're asking for possibly continuing the hearing for their full entertainment license for 2016 to coincide on the 16th so we can work that out with them and the 2016th license will be uh, decided at that point. What we're asking for tonight is for a vote to modify their current entertainment license to include a DJ for one special event on December the 19th. Um, this is something that's done on a couple other entertainment licenses where it's a specific number of events. They're asking for that modification for this one event as we work out what it's going to look like for the full term. Um, they are not asking for an increase in occupancy as building says there per the special permit in 2007 it was increased to 48 with seven employees they are not asking for an increase in that number 
Um, so we figured that is the compromise that we're asking for at this point to allow them for that one special event and to work out what is being discussed there in those comments. Okay. Um, this is a public hearing. Are there any comments from the, anyone in the public? So am I continuing the public hearing until December 16th? That's, that's what we're requesting, that continuing that public hearing for them to do that full license and to modify the current 2015 license for this one special event. Okay. For a DJ. Um, questions or comments from the board? Well, I, I don't know that I mind the one event. I think there were a number of things in here. For example, I, uh, at some point, the uh, material reads, and any other forms of entertainment, for example, which is something I assume you're going to take out because that's obviously so open-ended and it doesn't make any sense. Correct, and, and we want to work with them, and I think we just had a good discussion as to, you know, what they're looking to do um, yeah. and make that clear for as they go forward, especially since we're going for an annual license coming up okay. um, this year, and I know the definitions of the fire department included there for restaurant and nightclub, right. so. And there's no vegetative buffer, so we want to be sure we're doing things right. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, I'll entertain a motion to ex Continue the public hearing until December 16th and grant a one-time uh, special permit for a DJ on, what was the date? I believe it's December 19th. It's a uh, holiday party for a construction Saturday. company. December 19th. That's a, the Saturday. Saturday. That's a Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night. We're closing to the public. Um, okay, I'd be so happy to make that motion. You, Tobias got it. Okay. You got it? Yep. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Wait for Matt to get back here. But in the meantime, I'll open the public hearing to determine the tax allocation by classification percentage for residential exemption to be granted for 2016. Are we ready for this as well, or is this going to be We are not. I'm here tonight to request that we continue this until December 2nd. We and don't Jane. have final approval from the state at this time, although it is probably, um, we'll probably have it by tomorrow. But absent that final approval, we can't move forward with the tax rate hearing. Understand. I'll continue entertain a motion. motion to continue to December 2nd. Motion to continue till December 2nd. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Bob, could I have just a question before Deb leaves the mic? Um, so the the new assessments, if is that is that the right phrase, are up mm -hmm. on the website? They are. I invite people to look at them. We did send out notices to off-islanders, and we put a notice in the Inquirer and Mirror. Um, and we've been fielding inquiries for the past two weeks. And I believe we're getting a presentation on this on the second as well. Yes, you are. Great. So just, just helpful. And, and the tax rate will be based on those assessments is what we're talking about? Just so I want to get the Correct. relationship. The new, the new assessments. Fiscal 16. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next, Thank I'm going to open a public hearing to consider the joint petition for Verizon New England, Inc. and National Grid for... The relocation of two jointly owned poles, pole number 215-4A and 215-6 on Sudley side of Hooper Farm Road. Is someone here from National Grid or Verizon? Here we go again. <laughs> You know my feeling on this. You want to just say no and move on, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how important this is to somebody. Uh, yeah, you know, this it is might be for all we know. Uh, well, in, the, in our packet, the uh, this is all. This is no concerns, no problems. It's taking two poles out of a bike path. I think this is, you know, I'd move approval. This is a yeah. pretty yeah. easy one. I would. I would agree with Mr. Field that. All right. Well, this is, before we get too far along here, this is a public hearing. Is anyone here who wants to make comment on this? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing on this one and entertain a motion from the board. And move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Here we go again. Um, public hearing to consider the petition of National Grid and Antigua Electric Company to install a three inch conduit and five manholes and two transformer pads. Remo remove overhead wire. This is poles one through six on Monomoy Road. Now, I, before we get, okay, Don's abstaining. Uh, before we get going here, is there anyone to make public comment? Oh, Sarah. 
Come on, Sarah, Sarah Alger. Um, I was expecting the utilities to be here, but that's fine. Um, this work is being done at the request of my client at 47 Montemoy Road in conjunction with the owner at 45 Montemoy Road. They're the two owners that would be affected. They're the properties on the um, west side of Montemoy Road. We requested, I think we've paid National Grid um, a pretty significant sum to get these poles underground. I did have a call a couple of days ago from Arthur Reed representing the one other um, affected owner, the Hammond family at 46 Montemoy Road. And we have agreed with them that we're going to pay the cost of reconnecting them because they connect overhead to the pole. So when the poles come down, we'll reconnect them underground. So no so. one's going to be out of pocket here except your two clients. That's correct. Just to be clear, so the, the poles, the wires are going to go underground. There are four poles. And then come back up. The, yeah, you can only you have to take a certain number of poles down to to, to make it work. To make it work. Or, yeah. To make it actually work. So these four poles will, the, the wires will go down into these handholds, mm -hmm. then they'll go underground, and then at some point they'll come back up onto the poles. So they couldn't get the whole road to agree to take all the poles down. No, I'm, it's a pretty expensive, pretty expensive undertaking. Yep. So the um, four poles were the most that we could get organized. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there any other public comment? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, I'm for anything that takes poles away, Sarah. Um, my only concern is here is that they don't tear up Montemoy Road. Um, it's hard to tell from this drawing without having somebody here from National Grid. I assume that they're going along the shoulder it's of the road. The it's in the shoulder. Now, to connect the Hammonds, we'll have to do one road crossing. And Can they bore? Well, We'll try. All right. Um, but yeah, it's all on the road. It's all the poles. Oh, you mean to connect to the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. That's yeah. that's different. I th you know, six hundred a six hundred amp cable. It goes in a pretty big conduit. So yeah, I just want to. Yeah, that's in the shoulder. Okay. Um, comments, questions. No. Nope. Make a motion to approve. All right. Um, can I make a friendly amendment that they that the, it specifies that. Upon completion, the shoulder of the road is inspected by the DPW and to be deemed the appropriate fix. I'll accept yeah. that, that friendly amendment. That does, just digging a trench and filling it back in doesn't always make it right. So The neighbors are going to want it right. I, I was going to say the aesthetics I, here. I have they, no they, objection to that. They take you four poles I, down I, to make well, it look you know, better. I, I know. We, I know. I don't want to get off track, no but we, the service, underground service in my neighborhood went bad, and they, the National, Gr um, National Grid hired a, a subcontractor to do it, and they, they didn't do a good job. They, had, they made them come back but because we complained. So I just want to make sure that it's done. I think it's good, good diligent, due diligence. All right, so there's a motion with my friendly amendment. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes care of the public hearing <coughs> comment part of this evening. Now we'll move on to the town manager's report. Libby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item comes out of some discussions that have been had about how the town is going to move forward with some of its housing initiatives. And um, Remain has stepped forward and offered to provide an independent housing consultant resource to help further some of our initiatives, including the housing program, whatever that might end up being here at this site, some seasonal housing follow-up, and other town-related projects that, that might come up. Tucker Holland um, is here, and he would be the individual that would be the consultant. He would re It's pretty well outlined in the material, material in your packet, but he would report directly to my office. We'd meet on a regular basis um, with the planning director as well and report to the board on a regular basis and hopefully get some actions underway that we aren't able to do currently because we don't have the resources. Questions, Rick? Sure. Um, you know, when, when Remain funded our uh, energy position to start with or helped do it, Libby, we accepted a grant, um, a gift, I guess, and is this being handled differently from that? 
This isn't exactly the same thing, although this came up earlier this evening, and Andrew and I have talked a bit about the probable need going forward for a how some kind of a housing position in the town, whether it's full time, part time, who it is, we don't know anything about that. But this wouldn't necessarily be directly related to that. But, but I'm I not sure that was my question. I mean, the, the so the uh, in in this case, the the individual providing the service is is recommended in the letter. Right. Uh, I think in the prior example I used, my recollection is is we had an RFP after we received a gift and had an RFP. They were delinked. Yes. Here they're clearly linked, and I yep. just uh, think we all understand that number one because it's different. Um, so we're not accepting a gift, I guess, or are we? Do you we know are. what I'm trying we're, to get at? We are accepting a gift. Okay. That's basically. Okay. Well, we're not. I mean, we're not accepting best. money and then paying it out. We're accepting someone who's going to come and do some. So the work payment, for us. the cash payments involved in this are going direct from Remain to the consultant. Correct. I see. It's like some of the traffic stuff is paid directly by them. Right. The, the traffic. Some of the stuff. traffic studies and some of the other traffic things have been paid directly to them. It's a little bit different the way I read this map because um, in the traffic studies, I don't think the firm hired reported to, if that's the phrase, I'm not sure what phrase is here, the town manager or was directed by the town manager. Um, here, I think the implication is that that relationship is expected to exist. Okay. Yes. So it's a little different from, yeah, from a uh, consultant like uh, the folks who did the traffic right. and the parking studies, I think were, my recollection is were hired by Remain and their client was Remain. Here, Remain apparently is hiring an individual, but he, this implies that he's agreeing to be supervised and report to and have his priorities set by the town. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Good. I just I think we ought to be clear. Yep. Good. Thanks. It, it, it's a little complicated, yeah. but it's something that we, I think, need. Well, I, I don't have a if question we, about the need, Bobby. Yeah. I think I think the question might be, I think we might want to talk a little bit about the prioritization. There are a lot of uh, items listed here to be considered, and some may have a higher priority, at least in my mind, than others. And I think the board may want to talk about that. Uh, or the town manager may want to um, let us know the priorities as she sees them because you could find yourself working on all of them at the same time. And if we thought one element ought to be done in two months, it might not be. And I think that's something we should understand here. So I, I'd at least be interested in that. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you. Tucker? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tucker Holland. Um, just one clarification, or really two there. Absolutely, in terms of priorities as uh, identified in conjunction with the items in the proposal, would be a conversation both with the town manager and obviously looking for direction from the board of selectmen as well. Um, I do believe that the mechanics of the funding would flow through the town to clarify that point. Okay. Well, I think that I, I, I appreciate hearing that. I think that's okay. a good process if that's the way it's going to go. I think it's a preferred process. It makes the relationship clearer. So thank you for that. And one other thing I just wanted to be clear on, and Mr. Holland, you'd report to Libby and the board or? Yes. I think everybody reports to Libby, and Libby reports to us, and we uh, just usually, be, right? I mean, I great. Just want to be clear. Do you want to talk about priorities now, or at a different time, Libby? I mean, I, 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 I defer to you or to Bobby as the chair you, here. I don't mind if you want to give some ideas if now. Anybody's got anything off the top of their head? Well, I, I'll just uh, sure. The reason I raise it to, to me, the 
housing at this location um, has not moved as quickly as we want. I understand the resource issue, um, and I think that's something in my mind that ought to be a priority for this position to get that ready to have a, if it's an RFP whatever the process is so that in you know a month two months three months at the most we have something specific for us to get on with um, and some of the other things are more general they're planning oriented and so forth uh, they don't have the same priority in my mind as the effectively getting this project underway Tucker Holland again we are on exactly the same wavelength. Okay. Anybody else? I'll just throw one thing in there, Tucker, that for me the number one priority is housing for our seasonal work staff for the town because that's areas that we're, we seem to have difficult, yeah, I wouldn't disagree difficulty with that. funding every year, whether yeah. it be here. And, you know, well, I think part of this property would be a part of this, and right? You and I have talked about this, so you know that. So. And the good news is there are a number of organizations in the nonprofit community that would like to be a part of helping make something happen for all right so so maybe just thinking about you know you know I imagine mr. Hall is going to go out and and look into a number of different scenarios and see you know I know working with remain um, a lot of work has been done for kind of scoping on this site already um, but there's definitely a lot of different models as far as what kind of housing we want and um, I think it might be helpful just for us to think about you know maybe asking mr. Hall to come back in a month and kind of give us an update of where you're at and and you know just to make sure you're you're heading where where we think um, you're going it would be helpful Either that or we can get it through Libby great either one because he's going to work for her basically so great that, through and, us. I, and on this property I'd like to see the macro view for first and then work down into the details I'd like to see the big houses go here and the town building if it has to be built here goes here and you know sort of make sure yeah. that it's done as yeah, one whole piecemeal yeah one whole plan the entire property you don't have to build it all right away, but plan the entire thing so it makes sense and is going to work. Okay. Um, before we go any farther, though, we need to accept the grant. So is there a motion to do so? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Welcome aboard. Yeah, thank you to Remain. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Remain. Um, the next is... Mr. A Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. We have our health insurance consultant is here for an item that's under the selectman's reports, and he needs to catch a plane. Would it be okay. possible to take We're that? We're going to take it out of order then, and we'll do the, the uh, I believe it's the... Um, it's item one. Item one, which is the um, discussion or adoption of an HMO maintenance organization. But I, I think I need to clarify this. We're not actually adopting an HMO. We're just we're adopting the... Regulation allows us to add it in for collective bargaining in the future. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Steve Tuzik, Director of Human Resources. I'm here with Ed Byrne, who is our broker for insurances. And it's somewhat uh, to clarify it, it is we're looking for the adoption of uh, Chapter 32, Section 16, which will authorize the town to look and add additional benefit plans and so forth as. Uh, as applicable and as beneficial to the town and employees and retirees. We've been working with, with Ed, and in the packets you've seen the Blue Cross Blue Shield comparative analysis between an HMO that we've, uh, we've crafted with Ed and, and worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield, extremely cost effective, mirrors the exact same benefits we have with the PPO and uh, would be a benefit. So we are looking to, to authorize uh, the town and, and uh, if you could look at uh, accept Chapter 32, Section 16. But any questions with regard to the benefits specifically, Ed's here to answer. Questions from the board for Ed? Bobby, I don't. I think it's, you know, the, pl the plan is the plan, and it sounds like a good thing to move along with. So There's no questions. I'll entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. The yeah, others should. I would defer to you, but I would I would believe I so. Just the first yellow paragraph. I'm, I'm just wondering if you have to read the motion that was provided by town council. Is Somebody should read it. It's on a uh, I think it's just the first, first paragraph. paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. So I move that the board of selectmen vote to accept the provisions of general law section chapter 32B section 816 authorizing the Board of Selectmen 
to enter into a contract to make available the services of health care organizations to certain eligible and retired employees and their dependents, including the surviving spouse and dependents of such active and retired employees on a voluntary and optional basis and otherwise in accordance with the provisions of the statute. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm sorry, D don't go away. So that Ed's trip is not a total um, loss, <laughs> and he will be back on December 9th to give um, an overview of health insurance costs coming forward. Maybe we could take a quick look at this um, slide, just that, so the board can understand what the cost savings would be if the town is successful in getting the HMO on board after the required collective bargaining process, there are some significant savings for those who move over to it. So, so maybe just to be clear, so the, um, because our collective bargaining agreements are fairly specific, do we have to bargain this into those agreements? Is that what you're saying? Just so I know it? Um, it's, it's not because of our bargaining agreements. It's something that falls within a collective bargaining obligation to add, it sounds sort of silly, but to add a plan does require collective bargaining. Right, so we have to, but, but will we amend the agreements to, is that the way it's handled mechanically? Um, there would probably be a side letter. A side letter? Okay, thank you. The only, I have one question, Ed, and, and it's, it goes back to, um, I haven't had a, had a PPO and had a HMO. Um, when you come back and give your presentation, I really want to know more about who's in the network and wh how far the network goes because my experience when I had a, a, a is it an HMO? It was a nightmare to get the doctors that I went to. Okay, we actually did a disruption analysis, uh, which really means Blue Cross gave us all of the f uh, primary care physicians that are being utilized by people, employees, and their dependents out here. And once again, these were primary care physicians that were all over the country <laughs> because you have employees that are early retirees or retirees that left the state. And uh, of the, I counted up all the doctors in New England and we had an 89% match with HM Hope Blue to the Blue Care Elect, which is all we would ever get because you don't, there's no primary care physicians on Master Medical because it's an indemnity plan. You can go where you want to go. So 89% match is enormous, especially with the savings that go, Master Medical savings to go to Network Blue New England is almost 40% savings in premium. And the difference between Blue Care Elect and HMO Blue is 11%. So pretty significant premium reductions if your doctor happens to be in the network. There's no reason to change if they're not. But if they are in the network, it's something for everyone to consider. So all the local doctors here are in the network? Not all, but 89% of them. See, this is the issue I had is Dr. lepre has been my doctor since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. They consider him a surgeon and not a general practitioner. Yeah, once again, one, we, we can, that's part of the reason we're probably only at 89% is because there's, uh, there's uh, let's see, uh, sometimes... Uh, Physicians' assistants aren't considered primary care physicians, but they're listed as a doctor because there were charges with that person. Uh, nurse practitioners sometimes are considered or not considered. Probably we would have been higher if we could have structured it just to primaries because the difference between uh, Master Medical and Network Blue New England is you have to have a primary care physician because they direct all of your other care to all of those surgeons and specialists and everybody right, but else. Uh, but my point is a lot of people in Nantucket have Dr. Lepre as their doctor. Yep. So if we're going to try to get the town employees to switch to this, mm -hmm. that it's going to have to be really specific. Which doctors are in Nantucket, appro approved in Nantucket, and which ones aren't? Yeah, and we have that list. Okay. I'd like and to see that yeah. for the next Mr. Chairman. Oh, sure. I just was going to say, I, I wouldn't characterize it as we're trying to get them to switch. We, right. It is a simply another option right. for them to but select from. More but people would switch, I think, if they were comfortable with the list of exactly. doctors. Exactly, and that's going to be part of the education if we ever get to that stage where Blue Cross Blue Shield will come out here with a team of people to actually sit with them and go over their primary care physicians, you know, their kids' primary care physicians, their spouses' primary care, so that people aren't making the wrong decisions. 
if if this was approved, Mr. Chairman, we've scheduled uh, we have a schedule that will roll out first the communication of the summary plan, so everyone has a chance to read that before communication meetings with Ed, myself, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and we'll have several meetings. So if you miss one, you're not left null and void. There's a strong communication plan, and not everyone will migrate to HMO. It's it's just not for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Just one more question. This would be, assuming everybody, is, in, in theory, it would be great if they switch over to the HMO plan. That would remove the Cadillac tax that might exist for those master plans that I've heard about. It, it will. It will help with the Cadillac tax. It won't. Uh, it won't stop that from coming at us. Okay. But it, it will help. Yes. Okay. Can, just sorry. One more. How does that? How does it help? Uh, because, uh, once again, there's uh, two thresholds for the Cadillac tax, which doesn't come until 2018. But uh, when it comes, there's a tax on premiums, that ex annual premiums, both town side and employee com combined. I think it's $10,700 per year premium for an individual and like $28,000 for a family. If the amount of premiums that exceed that amount are taxed at 40%. And that 40% flows through everyone. So if the premium is less, there's less tax to be collected. Correct. Yep. Okay. We have a motion. We don't have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tobias read the motion. Matt seconded it. What was unanimous. The next item on the town manager's report is town enforcement process overview. Thank you. Um, can you go to the second one? Eric, you can go to the second slide. Okay. So how does town enforcement begin? There are a number of ways it begins. There's a required inspection. For example, there might be a building permit inspection or an HTC inspection or some other kind of town required inspection, maybe health department inspection. There would be um, complaints, notifications, neighbors complain sometimes, other people complain sometimes. It can be anonymous. Sometimes another department will notice something um, and notify the responsible department. Sometimes there are spot compliance checks, for example, the occupancy checks done by the fire department or the liquor license compliance checks that are done through the police department. There are several town officials overall responsible for enforcement, the town manager, the director of planning, who has a number of officials under him, the chief of police, the fire chief, and the health officer for the most part. The need for enforcement is determined through a number of items, state law, local bylaws, regulations. Sometimes there are regulatory decisions that require compliance with conditions of a special permit, for example. Generally, the enforcing agents are identified in any one of those situations. A couple of recent changes. We established a business license inspector position in 2014, as the board is aware. And some of that individual's duties include reviewing event permits, permit condition compliance, and that would be before, during, and after an event. And those are events like, you know, the um, wine festival and things like that. Not to pick one out, but road races, things like that. There is an ongoing review of entertainment license compliance. And then there's visitation to establishments to hopefully educate them about things like signs and banners, displays, and also respond to complaints about those types of things. Some additional recent changes include an encroachment policy that was rewritten in 2014, which is generally handled by the Department of Public Works. We've sort of recently, within the last 12 to 18 months, work to increase coordination between departments. We have periodic review meetings about what we call problem properties. We've had an issue with follow-up over non-criminal disposition 
notices. That's also called sometimes the bylaw violation or the bylaw ticket. And part of the difficulty has been the tickets are issued, they get filed with the town clerk's office, and no one ever goes back to find out if they were paid. So we've established much more of a formal policy on that where we're able to track them better and find out if they are paid. And a lot of times, if, even if they are paid, that doesn't necessarily mean the violation has been cured. It just means they've paid the fine, and they might get another fine as a result. We do need to reinforce the need for staff-driven identification of violations. Um, I think that what tends to happen is people go about their daily jobs and don't notice violations that should be noticed and bring them forward. Thanks to our public health officer, we have an online internal database of violations and actions taken by various departments. So if a complaint comes in, whoever takes it in logs it into this internal database and um, periodically they are all supposed to be checking it and whoever's responsible is to log in whatever they've done on the violation subsequently. And depending on how serious it is or it, it, depending on how serious it is, we might talk about it at a problem properties meeting to see if other departments need to get involved, to see if legal action might be required. So, some of these things tend to drag on because the individuals don't cure the problem and the timing for the fines and the notice and all of those required items take time and they take some significant follow-up depending on what exactly it is. And sometimes they're just isn't compliance, so we have to determine do we need to get town council involved and follow up on a, on, in a much more um, legal, for lack of a better word, manner, which can cost money. So if there's something significant like that, I've tended to come to the board, as you know, um, for some of those things. There's some rather noticeable ones out there that I think you're aware of. Um, this is just an example of what the complaint intake form looks like that the health department has developed. So you can see what it is. And then this is what the, go, go back a little. This is what the internal database looks like. This is just an example. There's some actual items in there. And so as, as you can see, people are supposed to sign in and note, make any notes and track what actions have specifically been taken. Some other recent changes include um, along the lines of the increased coordination of departments. The building department, police, and fire are coordinating now on allowable occupancy levels with floor plans being required to ensure accuracy and consistency on all applicable licenses and permits. And I know that a couple of you have asked about this. I've been um, asked the building department about a letter that was been sent out to people, businesses with COs who have these types of licenses. And it seems that um, architectural plans or, or stamped plans have been requested or required. And I haven't totally been able to find out yet. I don't know if Andrew has any more on it if that is a flexible kind of requirement, just in terms of who do those plans have to come from. There is an expense involved, and I know that there's been some people that have a concern about that. I think the, the reasoning behind it has to do with getting very accurate seating or capacity numbers that aren't, uh, I don't want to say made up, but that are that follow whatever the state standard is for how many square feet per person you can have in your establishment and to make sure everything is to scale. On, on that, I, I had some calls as well. I think the concern is that it's just done, it sounds like we're doing that, it's done fairly, that the same standard is applied to every uh, building mm -hmm. for their interior and their exterior. If that's, if we're gonna be licensing exteriors that you know, we don't just push the plan outside and make it louder and crazier downtown, that everyone follows the same rules. That's kind of the concerns I've heard. Some of the challenges with enforcement include entry onto private property. That's not always a given. In fact, it's mostly not a given. There's a very specific reasons when town officials can enter onto private property. 
Sometimes there's a need to determine property bounds with regard to encroachments using a registered surveyor. Not always, but sometimes. Um, legal action, is, it's not so much a challenge, but it's sort of deciding what, what are we going to take legal action on? How, how critical is it? Um, we don't have a nuisance bylaw. And I know we've talked a little bit about that. Roberto and I talked recently about, um, or actually we will tomorrow, um, about getting you a, a sample bylaw. There is a kind of a subjectivity issue that goes along with the nuisance bylaw, so we want to be clear on that. Sometimes regulations are unclear or bylaws are unclear. The balloon ban is not crystal clear. And as you know, there's been a, an amendment proposed by the Attorney General's office to make that clearer. And tracking, we haven't been very good at centralizing the tracking of the complaints that might involve more than one department, which is the reason for the internal database, and hopefully everybody is taking advantage of that. And that's it. Questions? Just, just one question on this, on this kind of uh, this complaint form we had in our packet. Is that that it says the health director? Is that just for the health department, or is there a general complaint form for? Everything, or um, we, like if someone has a complaint, if if I want to, that is something we probably ought to standardize. There isn't one complaint form that's universal throughout the town. It is department specific, okay. um, but people don't have to fill out that form. Right. They could call the health department. Right. They do not have to give their name. They could write something without giving their name. This right. just that's just a form that helps provide the necessary information that would be make it make it a lot more effective to follow up on something. Right. Have um have other departments started using the internal database yet, or is it just the health department has started it? The health department has started it. We need to get more people on board. Do you want to speak to that? So right now, I started the I brought in the database. I created the one that you see there. That one that you saw is only the first page of it. There's actually a whole separate section about follow-up, you know, how many times are we going to take it to court, how many order letters has it been returned, things like that. What we've been doing is through the police department and, plan and plus, we've actually started developing this access database that everyone will have access to. It's still in very beta format okay. and we're still just testing it out, but I've been, we've all been working together to be able to get some sort of a centralized database for all of this. It's, it's been working well in my department. We, what you saw is the actual working document yeah. in the packet. So, and those are real complaints on that. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. It'll be great to get everybody on board with it. Mm -hmm. I think it will and be so, really so, effective. So, just to be clear, though, that would be a, a job requirement, right? It's not some kind of voluntary thing. Eventually, Libby, everybody has to perform their duty and log in and record the. Uh, uh, enforcement issues they face. Yes. I mean, th yeah. Okay. And and you know I know this is a silly question, but I just want to make sure that natural resources included. I was going to ask about that. He wasn't on the list of. Oh, uh, he he probably should be on yeah. there. I, I imagine. Just yeah. Didn't have him on. Because I think that in, in in that case you often have ongoing requirements from orders of conditions, and. You know, I think we have to sort of be frank. I think over the years there's been a sense that the town has not been an active enforcer of permits and orders and conditions, and I'm, rightly or wrongly. Yep, no, I agree. And I, and I think that what we're trying to do, or the reason I think this is important, is that we, I think we have an affirmative responsibility. Otherwise, why go through all the detailed conditions if you're not willing to follow up on them? And I think the town's sort of a philosophical approach has to modify to reflect that. I mean, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Chief? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to caution everybody on the database thing. It, it, it's a Band-Aid that we've put together to get us to the point where we have a true permitting software system that includes the ability or some type of inspection, follow-up, et cetera. Um, Right now, like at the police department, we have a records management system that handles all of our complaints. Okay, but that's a closed system that we can't open up just to everybody in the town because of the the CJIS restrictions, criminal justice information system restrictions. Fire department has 
an inspection component in that same system that even I can't get into, you know, because of the restrictions on HIPAA and different things. But it, we'll never have a system where every complaint, like on entertainment and buildings and 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 fire and health, and it will be in one system because of all these restrictions. But there, through a decent permitting software system that has an inspection component, we can bring a lot of the coordination together. And until we get there, we'll never have something that we can all get into is what I'm saying. This other thing that we just put together here is really, it really is a real weak Band-Aid to at least get a little bit of coordination between the primary departments that are out there working on the problem properties. I have one question is we've talked about overcrowding, we've talked about police, we've talked about liquor, we've talked about fire, we've talked about occupancy. There's one on here that's very important to me that we haven't discussed and I want to know how between now and spring we're going to enforce the fertilizer regulations. Right. Because, because last year we were going to hire somebody, right. I thought. So, and you know, we if, we're going to, if we're going to hire somebody and we're going to start training them, we should probably start thinking about it sooner than later. Because does that fall under your department of the Board of Health, or does that fall under natural resources, or is it a joint op operation? But I don't want to go through another fertilizer season with just letting people. F I mean, we have these regulations, and some people adhere to them, but there's a, there's a good port of the pe portion of the people that just spread whatever they want, and we can't continue to do that. And that, and of course, it's a, it is a board of health regulation that we have, uh, but it is interdepartmental. I've been working with Jeff to see how we can get better enforcement from the, what happened this past year. Uh, Sometimes the way it was enforced was lackluster. Uh, so we're looking to. I've been working with Jeff. I actually have him. Um, I've reached out to him so that we can get a meeting either next week or the week after, so that we can really tackle this. And then once that's once we get this laid out plan, we will be obviously presenting yeah, it so that we can make sure it's enforced correctly. Yeah, but you know, to, to you know, kind of second some of Bobby's thoughts. You know, I think it is something. You know, Roberto, I'm not sure you're prepared to go out there with a you know nitrogen soil sample or take test. You know, you do need some level of expertise to understand yeah. this. And you know, I, I'm not sure if if, if you're going to be the person or Jeff is, or if if we need some direction. And, um, and how we get on the property and all that stuff. We need to figure that all out now because, I mean, I, I'm sure every board member here got stopped by landscapers who are, are adhering to it, and they told me of numerous other landscape companies that were just blatantly abusing it. And they wanted to know why no one wasn't doing anything to enforce the regulations. Right. And I didn't have an answer for them. And I don't want to go into another fertilizer season without having an answer. One, one, of the, one of the ways that we would be approaching that, that Jeff and I have been throwing out in the air, was requiring these landscapers that are coming onto the properties to provide us with the actual soil sample so that we can specifically say in that soil sample through either the University of Massachusetts at Amherst or through Purdue University, it tells you specifically what fertilizer you can use and for what you're going to be growing. That's part of one of the things we're looking for, maybe even impl implementing that this year once we do that certification, when we go through that permitting process where we tell them every property that you're going to be working on, you need to provide that soil sample so and that we know what they're putting in Here's a question. There. How would you ensure that they Products took that property? They took it from that property in the right spot. I mean, the, in, you know, if I, if I were cheating, I'd go and take it from, on the roadway on the way home and... Naturally, there will always be some people who are going to be cheating, and that's, that's part of what the enforcement process is. Right now, when we, when we require that portion and tie their license, or not license, but their permit to that, most of the people will get a lot of compliance. We'll get those compliance, and then, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. 80 people comply, and then we'll spend most of our time tracking down those 20 people rather Robert. than... Just One of the things that I suggested last year, and it was too late in the season to, to put it into place, but you might consider it this year, is that you, you go to the GIS map and you have, the, you have the names of every property owner in the harbor watershed. And mm -hmm. you send them a letter saying, yep. we need to know who your fertilizer uh, applicator is. And then you can take that list and you can compare it to the licensed guys. But, you know, if they're got, we. It's, if you have certain individuals that you know are abusing the rules and you have a list of the properties they are taking care of because the owner sent you, said, so-and-so is my landscaper, I mean, I think it's something that we should know. Who is the landscaper on these properties? Is it the homeowner? Is it, is it an individual? Is, you know, is the company reputable? Are they actually, do they have the fertilizer license? We have no idea knowing right now because we don't know who's doing the landscaping on these properties unless you happen to drive by the driveway and the truck's coming out. So Understood. 
I think we need to collect that for the harbor watershed sooner than later. Understood. Bobby, this is maybe a small thing, but I, I was always like um, when we provide a license, which we do for all fertilizer app, app, appliers or applicators, <laughs> um, that at the end of the season they'd be required to certify they follow the rules. And so then you have, um, when you find they don't, you know they've been dishonest to you. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I promise I did the right thing and their personal signature on that. So mm -hmm. just, just think about that. Um, and Libby, I just want to be clear, uh, because I said earlier I thought we were trying to hire somebody and we were unable. Was that correct? Yes. Okay. I just don't want to misspeak. Yep. Nobody okay. applied. And that's in the budget again. So there are budgeted funds or there will be this year coming up for next yeah, summer. I can't. I, I think so. If, I if, if that's check. necessary to make the plan for enforcement work, I just want to be comfortable that the resources are provided going into the summer you know so we don't it's it's a find oh we don't have enough money you know yeah well it's you know it's i think it's a you know i attended the nantucket biodiversity initiative you know this weekend and you know the the situation in the harbor isn't getting any better and hasn't gotten any better over the last 25 years and so it's it's time to take this really seriously and you know i'm i'm con consistently hesitant whether or not we're even going to be able to accomplish what we want with these regulations and I think if we talk about um, you know spending a, a large amount of money on sewer you know to deal with this certain you know seven percent of the problem or eight percent and and we're not dealing with the other seven percent or eight percent and, and spending you know at the minimum five hundred thousand dollars a year you know just to kind of put it in perspective you know what are we doing that's just that's a poor way of spending money um, so, so I'd you know really advocate as a board. You know, we need to take this. If if our town manager needs additional funds to hire two staff people, that's that's worth it in comparison to the sixty right. million dollars we're going to spend on sewer. You know, to it's nitrogen is nitrogen. Well, I I agree, and you know, I'm 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 one I'm one more. I have a year and a half left in this board, and I'm about a year away from going back to town meeting with a complete fertilizer ban because so far I haven't seen any changes in what's what's occurring out there. Uh, part of that is on us though. We, we Like I said, we have no idea who's doing it and where they're doing it. And, you know, I think last year we, when I brought this up, when we had the workshop, it was late in the season and it was too late to get this database in place. But I think it's, it's now's the time to start this database through the Board of Health, through National Resources, or through the two, two two entities working together to get a data place in place. I mean, it's easy enough to send out a mailing to all these property mm -hmm. owners, say, we need to know who your landscaper is going to be for the 2016 landscaping season. And then we can check so that can name to the list. You got it. And if they're not on mm -hmm. there, and then we, if we know we've got, you know, maybe it's only 15 or 20 guys that are doing all these properties. And it might be, then it would be a lot easier to police, you know. Then we could, you know, there, some of the landscapers suggested that they have a landscape, uh, a fertilizer schedule for each of these properties. When they're going to fertilize, how much they're going to fertilize, and that would be held by either natural resources or you. But mm -hmm. right now, I think we have... It know, could be a requirement of the license. Right. We're, we're not anywhere near it, and there's a lot of people other than me who are frustrated with this and ready to, to you know, say, this isn't working. And the, Cormac and I have had numerous conversations about this. And... and you know, Bobby, uh, to add in one more point, you know, when it when it comes to a property that, you know, is isn't in compliance, or or you know, you know, my neighbors out there spreading copious amounts, and what you know, I I, I think it's nice for us to think about, you know, does the health department have the legal authority to go on that property and take a soil sample test? So so let's let's be honest about that. You know, the, these I think there's going to be a lot of folks who have you know, twenty million dollar waterfront properties, and they're going to want a green lawn. And our health department, or natural resources, or the police department—not that you're going to get into the soil sampling, chief—doesn't have the authority to really enforce this. Mm -hmm. And and we need to think about that seriously. Otherwise, we're just saying, hey, we'd like you to enforce it. We're going to try all these other things, but when the when the push really comes to shove, it, we're we're not doing anything, and we're we're, we're spending a lot of time and, and hot air on it. One of the biggest issues we always run into with uh, an enforcement is the Fourth Amendment issue. You know, yeah. we can't just walk onto people's property regardless of whatever department we are. Um, 
we, we can't just go into this property 400, 500 feet into these people's oh, gate oh, I, just to go through their front door I, and take a sample. I yeah. totally understand, but th that brings up other, you know, I, I think that's important to understand. Tobias, there are all kinds of ways to uh, get people's attention and um, well short of having to go on their property. Once you start to identify people and identify them publicly, um, I think a lot of things will happen. And, and well, you know, nobody yeah. wants to be singled out. I was in one of so the lumber yards yeah. yesterday, and I saw a whole pallet of fertilizer going in the back of a landscape truck, a yeah. full pallet. So it's fall fertilizing season. You know, is anybody out there seeing how much is being spread? So well. let's get that address in the system, Bobby. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hear you. But, uh, that, but that's another good point from, you know, Mr. Acosta. You know, I, I think establishing a relationship, you know, with, with the, the entities that are selling this, you know, yeah. and, 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 and giving us a warning or something. I don't, the, you know, to me, there's, there's a lot of legal questions that, you know, I don't think we can go ask, well, what did so-and-so go buy or how much fertilizer have you sold or go down the steamship and say how many, you know, truckloads of, you know, fertilizer have come over. You know, that's hard for us to do. So I'm, 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 I hear you, Rick, but I, I see the harbor still degrading, and I'm not sure getting through those glitches, you know, we'll probably get there in, in three, four years to have good enforcement policy, but I'm not sure that's, that's sufficient. I'm not satisfied I, I with that. I, I, there, you can deal with those problems, but long before you get to that, next season, you're not going to solve those legal problems by June. So you need a mechanism right now, a plan, and I think we ought to ask the town manager to come back to us in 30 days or less and say, here's my plan to deal with enforcement of the fertilizer regulations for next season. That's what the assignment ought to be, and I think we ought to say that's important. And I think the health officer and the natural resources officer ought to, make, ought to get that message clear, and we put a deadline on it and get underway. And that way, if we need to appropriate more money for more hiring, we can do well, it. Whatever we need. We need something that shows us how we're going to accomplish this. There'll be one other question on the uh, overall. The encroachment issues, we had talked, I think one of the recommendations of the new policy was to, what, cut off permits or COs or things like that if people weren't complying. Is my recollection, do you remember? Oh, I don't remember. I didn't bring a copy of it with me. Kara, do you know? We talked about working with the building department with the as built and it's not something that we've um, been able to incorporate. So we have um, gone to the town association and to other locations to ask people to report issues to us. So we have been dealing with them on a report by report basis. Okay, thanks. And one other question, Bobby, just while we're on this subject. The anonymous, how does someone um, make an anonymous call, an observation, call it a complaint. But is it a phone call? Is it a written process? And how are they protected if they choose that they want to be anonymous? Sometimes um, anonymous complaints don't get followed up on very well because there's no way to get more information from the person who complained. And I th think if somebody comes in and says, I want to make a complaint, but I want to be anonymous about it. That's going to depend almost on who's taking it in. I think that most people will honor that. If not, everybody should honor that. But sometimes, you know, it depends on, on how they're doing it. A phone call is fine. You know, there's all kinds of ways to submit an anonymous complaint, yes. I was just going to note that um, through the website, you can make comments to the town through the website and we have actually received numerous complaints um, regarding enforcement from too many people in the house or too many mm -hmm. too many things like that um, and we've tried to respond a couple times to the people and they have dummy emails but I do still make a point to forward them on to the zoning enforcement officer or the health inspector or whoever they comes up. So, so that's one mechanism to... Well, there, there's a way to be anonymous if you want to be. But you know, I, I think that's an important question, though, Rick. You know, we're, we're talking about, 
you know, enforcement of fertilizers, you know, a lot of that is going to come from, you know, folks kind of helping us out and saying, well, I saw right. so-and-so enforcing it. I think it would be upon us and, and the town manager to kind of lay out a clear process for what that might take place so folks are aware of, you know, who they can call. And, yeah, you know. I, I mean, it's sometimes it's a fine line because anonymous complaints can sometimes be frivolous and not factual at all and meant to bother people. You know, and, and I, 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 I totally agree with that, Libby. I, I just think in general, I think it's important. I'm just trying to figure out how we deal with it because I know that you know when you're dealing with neighbors and friends and all those things, it gets socially difficult to be a public complainer. And, I think, uh, I think I'm not sure I'm trying to promote that. I've just you mentioned the term, so I'm trying to understand how we implement it. I, it sounds it's, like it's a case by case basis. It's kind basis. of a case by case basis. I okay. think most people can tell when it something of a valid anonymous complaint is coming in versus right. okay thanks payback. okay i think we beat this up pretty good let's move on to fiscal 2016 first quarter budget reports mr chairman as i mentioned earlier the sewer enterprise solid waste enterprise and our island home are not ready they will be put on your december 2nd agenda yep. so That's the other ones fine we can break these up it'll make it a little more Actually, think maybe in the future we should do it that way, Libby, if you don't mind. Break them up a little. Yeah, it's a little. Otherwise, a there's lot. so much to absorb at one time. Okay. If it, everyone's That's agreed. A good idea. We'll do three and three. That's a good way to do it. Brian, the floor is yours. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, for the first quarter revenue in the general fund, we're up approximately 3.78 percent from last year. And it's mainly driven by an increase in uh, state aid as well as an increase of about $335,000 in the local uh, rooms and meals tax, which cons consistently are performing, outperforming the prior year, uh, year over year numbers uh, to date, as well as an increase in building permits. We're up about $38,000 uh, from last year in building permits as well, and we're up probably roughly around 15 or 20 in uh, plumbing and electrical as well. Do you know the percentage on that, Brian? Mm -hmm. uh, the building what percentage it's up from last year uh no but i can do it when i sit back down real no, quick just, but it's just curious <clears throat> it doesn't matter probably about three or four percent basically is what it works out to be <clears throat> so revenues are are tracking uh one thing that in the department or the uh revenue by function category you'll notice an, a large increase in the marine and coastal resource uh which is due to the timing of the opening of the town pier and when all of the payments for the slips came in after july 1st versus the way we had usually done it in April and then a payment in September. So that's primarily driving that large increase right there. Other than that, everything is tracking to where I would expect it to be. Uh, motor vehicle excise is down a little bit, but I had expected a slight blip or reduction um, year to year in the first quarter because of the amount of uh, prior years that we had collected before June 30th. If you remember, we had a significant increase in what we had collected last year. Um, so I expected with some smaller commitments and some of the prior bills having already been or passed due motor vehicle excise bills collected, I did anticipate a small reduction there. So it's not something that I'm really that worried about at this point. Brian, just one question. On the, uh, the increase of state aid, 3.7%, was that mainly due to the town It's tier? Chapter 70. No, chapter 70. The chapter 70 is the primary driver of uh, state aid for the for the town, um, and that's primarily pretty much exclusively where it rides. There was a small and unrestricted state aid, but the primary increase is exclusively to Chapter 70. So it was so it was up three percent versus. It's prior? a uh, it's an eight hundred thousand dollar increase that we'll get over the year. So um, it's about a hundred. It's about two hundred thousand, depending on the timing of the quarterly payments on a on a quarterly basis. So, so is that partly rate and partly the population or the student uh, it's, census? It's basically a, a fund, the funding formula that they, they use for uh, the foundation budget, and they did increase the funding um, by the about, rate. I think it was approximately $30 per student. Um, so that's the primary driver of where that increase came from, which was the um, governor and lieutenant governor, for their commitment. 30 times 1,500 is X. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Brian, I guess you're not done yet, are you? No. That was just the income. That was just the revenue. Let's hear about expenses. There are none. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. <coughs> so
so expenses are um, pretty much where I would expect them to be as well. There are a few increases uh, in finance and operations. We had about a $26,000 increase, which was the completion of the contract for the triennial revaluation that we just went through. Um, so that, that was completed um, around August. So that was uh, what that increase was primarily from. Information systems, as people will probably see, is, has a significant drop uh, year over year. And the reason for that is because we, as of September 30th, we're still finalizing and kind of wordsmithing the support agreement with Munis. So we had actually not paid that as of September 30th. So that is uh, where that drop is coming from uh, in terms of the about $115,000. Everything else is uh, fairly pretty much in line with what we had budgeted. Um, I didn't make a note in here that the police department had a, an increase in, in talking with the chief. That's because as of starting on July 1st, they had a full complement of police officers. So that would, that would be why they would have an increase there. As well as with public works, um, the filling of positions throughout the first quarter is, uh, which were budgeted um, has, is driving their increase. Just a couple notes at the bottom, which I did make. Um, typically we have always done the, uh, transfers for the subsidies on a quarterly basis that was actually posted on October 1st in error and not September 30th so that's why there's about a 1.9 million dollar gap there it has been done as of October 1st so you'll see in the next quarter presentation you'll see a significantly larger number in that quarter because we'll be posting two transfers at that time um, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me when I was looking at this was I was amazed that debt service principal had gone down so much in a quarter but um, during the review last year, there was a journal entry made in October to correct the fact that we had inadvertently posted some debt service that should have been in the general fund to the, the respective capital project. So in October, we made a journal entry to fix that. So that's why there's a little bit of a variance there. When you add them, put the what should have been in the first quarter from 2014 together, it's less than 3% change, which is typical in terms of the way the debt's been structured. And we do look at this on a monthly basis all the time, looking at the trends to make sure if there's any questions, we, we do reach out to the departments to, to make sure we understand what's going on and that they're, um, they're understanding and it's within what they were expecting to happen. So, Bobby, Bobby just maybe one question, not so much on this quarter, Brian, but mm -hmm. um, so we had our free cash certified, right? Yes. And, and if you went, I always think of it as a, essentially two elements uh, you know expenditures are less than budget and revenues over budget correct or roughly the combination sure. if you looked at your um, numbers through June 30 which you had several months ago were you pretty close just on the rough estimate of what free cash should be uh, I was close. There was a few things. There, free cash is also made up of balance sheet adjustments that the things that we have to reserve and changes in encumbrances. Mm -hmm. um, so just looking at revenue and expenditures, where I believed it was going to come in, we were we were pretty close. Pretty close. We, um, okay. With some of the other changes, it obviously increased it um, to what it was certified to. But um, on a pure revenue over an expenditure basis, it was pretty close to where we expected the year to end. So would that have been 80% uh, of free cash or 50, the, the rough numbers? Uh, it's probably 80 to 85% would be a, a very good mark. There was okay. some things that were on the balance sheet that got taken back. We were able to take them back. So that would be um, that would account for probably about 15%. So I would say 80 to 85% is a fair, okay. fair mark. Thanks. Any questions for Brian? Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rafter. Good evening. Uh, our first quarter, we our revenues were down slightly over last year. You may recall that last year we had a very strong first quarter because of a number of one-time late collections. However, we uh, made some adjustments this year, including rate increases plus the PSC, so that got us up closer. The good news is that the expenses are down significantly, and again, a lot of that has to do with the fuel. The price of fuel was much cheaper this year than last year. So our net uh, earnings changed by about almost 650000 to the good. Um, so it was a very good first quarter. September was very strong for us. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have on any details. Our uh, retained earnings were certified at $2.2 million. And when you back out everything else and add in the other things, our fund balance right now, or well, 
the end of September was about 2.9. So, so Tom, the, the primary driver here is still the fuel sales or the net earnings the net, on yes. that? Um, it, it's the primary driver for reduction in expenses, but in covering our revenues and bringing them up to where they need to be, it was the PFC and the uh, rate increases that we, we put mm -hmm. forward. Tom, last I believe it was last year we you put in place an employment fee or a the passenger facility charge. Passenger yes. facility charge. When did that take place? It started last year, but it was not in the budget because we didn't have the FA approval by town meeting. Right, and, and the reason why I ask is I'm just curious: is is there an increase of numbers in September in this quarter? The, the first quarter, yeah, it's in here. Um, I want to say it was a few hundred thousand dollars. Just because it would be helpful to figure out, you know, it's if more people. Two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars in the first quarter of this year. Just because it's helpful to know, you know, if we had more folks coming over in the shoulder season this year versus last year. Just an indicator. I'm just curious. Yeah, if, one way to look at it too is uh, based on fuel sales, and if you look at the jet fuel sales, um, August was up. Or I'm sorry, July was up, August was down, and September was up. Our Fuel September was very strong this year. But aircraft operations were up slightly in July, down a little in August, and down significantly in September. Yeah, I. Looking at the graph, the graph chart on the side, Tom, is what yeah, I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. Trying to just think. The, N the NMA, 13 to 15. Yeah, they were up slightly in September. Uh, up slightly or up or down? Isn't they're, they're up in September, oh, okay. down I'm in looking, August. Isn't the blue 15? Blue is, yeah, and September's the far right. Yeah. So it's it's up slightly. To 12,170. I think we're looking at different charts because the yeah. one Bobby's looking at in my packet yeah, is. Yeah, ours is the other way. Oh, July yeah. is up. July is up. July's July is left. up. August is down. August is down. September's, September's down. Up. September says uh, in don't forget that I sent you all an email earlier this week that had a revised I'm going by the one in our packet that yeah, I loaded so this afternoon it's different it's different oh, okay never mind but thanks Tom that, that's correct there all July was up August down <laughs> you get things in your mind Bobby I did too I said <laughs> I, I look, look yeah. at that going here yeah. revenue's up but landings are down I thought that's a pretty cool thing <laughs> Any other questions for Tom? No. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Want a comment? Good evening. Okay. We won't use Your landings screen. are up, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I like the airport numbers. Um, Obviously, in one a comment, you can see by the, the revenue and uh, the net earnings for the quarter that it reflects the seasonality of our enterprise operation. This first quarter is historically and should be the biggest revenue month that it is, and it's also, the, with the exception of electricity, the one of the lower um, expense months because maintenance doesn't start until the second quarter. You just can't get out there and do anything at that time. So we're gearing up now for some uh, two major uh, projects as well as maintenance. So our, our um, benchmark, if you will, will be at the end of the second quarter where we like to see water sale revenues between 60 and 65 percent. Then we know that we're in a pretty good shape going into the lean months. So. Right now we're we're uh, about where we expect to be a little higher on revenues actually, but um, in in um, good financial shape right now. Question: What are the major projects you're looking forward to? You mentioned two of them, Bob. Pardon me. You mentioned two major projects you're looking yes. forward to. What um, are they? We opened bids today on um, the first phase of the hydrant replacement program, 
where 65 hydrants over 40 years old will be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, next year, hydrants between 30 and 40, and then 20 and 30, and then from thereafter, it'll be a rolling replacement. The minute a hydrant hits 20 years, it's gone. It's just not cost effective to rebuild them like it used to be yeah. and get parts. So the second, the larger project is the Wires Valley water supply replacement, which we opened bids last week, and um, the two new wells will be put in to replace the old tubular system over the winter. So this is the, the wells that we all sort of talked about earlier this year of, of that project the, yeah um, the the well replacement is two hundred and forty nine thousand for two wells um, the whole project is probably going to come in at about a million four by the time you're done with the electrical the controls right. the piping back into the system but so the, the bid bids were um, better than we expected and uh, although there was only one bidder it's a crazy market out there right now. There's um, the low bid on the on the hydrant project was from the Cape, hmm. so it's uh, um, now correct. It's going to be in. Pardon me. Didn't you say, Bob, that once you get those new wells, it will increase capacity and also decrease electricity? Yeah, the the state uh, was very great, and they said you're not going to get more capacity, but we'll be able to use that capacity now. We've never been able to hit that shallow well field capacity the the pumping system just couldn't do it now we'll have and the redundancy without that old vacuum is just going to make life a lot easier great be able to sleep through a night in july maybe um but i must say dp has been real helpful on this but so Pardon me? Just a quick question on the hydrants. I imagine you're working with the DPW. I know there's talk in the past uh, with Dave Fredericks about relocating some of them in town. Is is that going to be taking place as you replace some of them? I know um, it's only a few. But. Yeah, any, any, the hydrants, the intent is to replace them in where they are, with the exception of, of some that um, we've looked at with... Uh, um, last year with Mark McDougall and, and like at the corner of Washington and Francis, that'll be a goner. They're just not going to get replaced. It's it's not the chief said we can do without that one, and it's not a great spot. So others others will be moved around a little bit, but um, well, big and big improvement. We've got to have the worst looking fire hydrants in Massachusetts right now. As long as they work, <laughs> they work. <laughs> They're not pretty. I drove an ugly truck around yeah. for a lot of years, but it ran. I'm still driving yeah. one, Bobby. I chief, you don't care what it looks like as long as water comes out of it. <laughs> All right. Now we get to go on to my favorite subject yep. in the world, Sconset water. Yeah, mine too. Uh, Sconset also has uh, experienced uh, a good um, a revenue a quarter. They're at 51% of, of their revenues. Sconset is definitely uh, the pattern in Sconset has changed over the couple of years. The, the revenue um, really gets big at the, in this quarter, and then life ends. It it drops right off. And by January, out of 800 accounts, they'll have maybe 75 or 100 will actually have consumption in a month. That's and it. But it picks up. It's it's not like this in Sconset. It's up and then down. And so, um, and expenses are, are in Sconset are electricity right now. You know, they don't have employees, and, and um, Sconset system is in, in pretty good shape right now. So um, the commissions are, are meeting to um, review the draft legislation for the consolidation, and that's moving ahead. So I think... Um, Wisconsin, some, with except there are some issues with some old water mains, but all the capital is starting to play up, pay off in Wisconsin. Questions on Wisconsin? But what happened? The, the the lot sale proceeds are in, and and what happened to that money? Pardon me. You sold a lot in Wisconsin where the water tank was. Where where'd that money go? That money. That money will stay with this consolidated entity. 
it it will um Sconset is going to be doing two um projects with cash reserves from the sale of that tank lot and one is um the upgrade of the water meter system so we don't have to send anybody out there to read them anymore we'll read them from want to comment and can people be able to see where the water is going the second is after Juno we realized we've got to do a little something to make the the road into the tank into the propane tanks and generators a little more all weather than than it is the, the little skim coat of gravel just isn't cutting it anymore so we're going to rebuild that and and um, and that'll be done that's not much money Seventy-five thousand or so. Yeah, I have one question about yep. Sconset. I know you guys had an agreement with um, what was it? There? Not AT and T, um, Verizon to put a tower on yep. the top of the. Is it is it up and is it working? It it is working. If you have, uh, because we are getting a lot of complaints. It doesn't work. Yeah. Well, we finally nailed the Verizon guy down. He said, "Well, if you have four G." It'll work. If you have any other Verizon service like 3G, not going to work for you. So it's uh, but the system has been glued to the or anchored better to the tank now, and um, um, so it is on. It is working. If you're not 4G, you're not going to know the difference. We got the check though, right? Yeah. You got the check. You get the right. check from Verizon whether yeah. it's working or not. Yeah, we get the matter. check. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the check's nice. <laughs> just, just to follow up on you know Rick's comment, you know Bob, you said the, you know I recall just vaguely the property was worth you know, eight hundred thousand or something or, sold for that, and then you know you said the upgrade of the, the meters would be about two hundred thousand, yep. then seventy five thousand for the road. So is that the additional? Money goes into your retained earnings. Into your retained earnings and yep, those those funds have been um, will be uh, the authorization to use that money will be put forth at this upcoming town meeting. Okay. But it's um, the meter is is going to be um, it's going to extend the life by another fifteen years of the units. And just the customer service aspect is well worth it. That's it. Thanks. Any other questions? Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Okay. The rest we'll do next week. Uh, let's. We move on to review of the proposed and potential 2016 annual town meeting warrant articles. Okay. So what was in your packet is outline number three. This is the third time we've been talking about warrant articles for the 2016 annual town meeting. And I highlight, I've been trying to highlight or somehow note items that have changed since when you last discussed it. So just quickly going through this, and then I have a list of articles or potential articles that you wanted to have some additional discussion about. Um, so going down to other appropriation or finance related. Yeah. There are a couple of, of yellow things there. Supplemental funding for island home design. That was something that was in early as before the special town meeting and I think we're probably not gonna put that forward at this point pending a more thorough review of operational models and design issues for the island home in with the existing appropriation. The second item I s crossed out supplemental funding for Brant Point Boathouse because we've now taken care of that at the special. Supplemental funding for Children's Beach concession renovation. We, we're having a meeting later on in the week about the Children's Beach, con Beach concession. The existing funding that we have is only going to fund the bathroom bathhouse portion of the project. It won't fund the improvements that we were hoping to do to the concession itself, we would need an additional appropriation for that. So hopefully later in the week we're going to get from our architect a potential number for that. It isn't in the capital 
projects right now because this all came in late after the capital projects were already submitted. So we didn't put a new number in for this. So I don't know how you all feel about it, but we don't really have a good number right now anyway. So that may have to be a fiscal 18 item. But just to follow up to make sure I understand, do we have a number last year for this? We've had two appropriations right. for Children's Beach. So those numbers are still there? Uh, those numbers articles? are still there, and we're going to use them to fund the bathroom portion the of the bathroom project. The bathroom portion, okay. And there probably won't be too much left. There will definitely not be anywhere near enough left over to do renovations to the concession building. Um, the airport may or may not need additional funds for the general aviation building, admin building. We're in additional discussions with them now, I would say. Bylaw amendments. Um, there's a couple things that were, well, not all of the yellow I'm going to go over because those are things that I'm continuing to work on. No, item number five, bylaw to allow sewer commissioners to add to sewer districts without a vote of town meeting. This this is a, is a suggestion, so at some point I'll need to know if you want to proceed with that or not. I don't know if I've gotten a good sense from you so far on that. I, I would, you know, I was part of uh, making sure it went to town meeting when we originally did it 15 years ago. I would want to keep it the same because the politics on the board change, and some people think that you can you know, the taxpayers can pay it and it's easy, we can expand and everything's free. So I'd be, you know, I'd be hesitant to take it out of town meeting myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's, you know, what we have now seems to work. There may be some timing issues, but I don't know that I've heard they're that critical, so. And no, in regards to, you know, 106 Surfside, there was, you know, some thoughts on on uh, how that affected that development, you know, the fact that town meeting has the authority and the selectmen don't when we drafted our letter, and I think that's important. That's another reason, perhaps, just to leave it the way it is. Uh, you know, Libby, I know you, there's a lot on your plate here. If you want to just pull this now. Yeah, I'd be, sure. I'd be I'd, happy to I'd, see I'd, it. I already did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to give you the form of the red, the green thumbs light. up. Thank we don't, you. We don't okay, want you to out. think we we're still wanting you to go okay, forward. Okay, it's, it's up. The... Um, Agricultural Commission right to farm bylaw proposal. It, it's attached to your packet. I, the board of the commission had a meeting last week that Roberto attended, and I think they probably intend to submit this as as a citizen warrant article. So we don't we won't need to necessarily. So we can take it off our list. Yep. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Um, the coastal property liability bylaw. I have that on my list for just a few minutes when we for further discussion. Um, proceeding down <coughs> here, the home rule petitions, I still need to look at the ferry embarkation fee a little bit. I did speak with the Barnstable Town Manager last week about his thoughts on the, the politics of this, and I probably need to talk to the other town managers involved, or maybe you all need to talk to your counterparts in the affected towns, But and I also need to talk to Representative Madden. But it seemed that this might be more effective if everybody was in on it, not just one town. What, had that been the idea that we would increase it just for us and not well, anybody else? I, I, I don't know what our oh, okay. thinking was on that, but I think it's only probably going to be effective if everybody gets in on it. Because right we, now, every town, whether there are four of us or whatever, each get a chunk? Yep. Um, there, yeah, your prior meeting, you also had some discussion about maybe not increasing the fee, but trying to get the commuter books um, in, involved. I don't know how much additional revenue that's going to give us, but it might be some kind Substantial. of a Substantial. Um, okay. So the uh, other yellow items are just sort of continuing to be worked on. So the last page with my list on it. The right to farm bylaw we just talked about, so that's off. The bylaw to about the sewer commissioners amending sewer districts without vote of town meeting, that's off. And then the remaining three are items that are sort of outstanding. The coastal property bylaw, revisit it or rewrite it. A home rule petition, um, oh, that shouldn't say explanation, that's supposed to say expansion of room occupancy tax to seasonal vacation rentals, and whether or not we want to proceed with an island home and an operating override to fund some or all or 
whatever of the island home general fund subsidy and I think we probably need to get together some better numbers on that before you can make a real informed decision so Brian and I can work on that but the other two so when are we gonna, are we gonna talk about these other two right now is that well the plan? that was my thought unless you want to talk about them at a different time but I just no, would, I, I'm gonna start let's, reminding let's you let's start the let's start the dialogue so let's start with the coastal property bylaw like this is really your baby from last year yeah and I think the the main concern I heard last year was the portion that applied to existing properties as opposed to new properties and so Bobby I thought that might be one way to um, make it more palatable I still think it's a good idea conceptually to get underway so that's the thought I had in my mind well is there a consensus on the board that we want to go forward with this or is this something that we have how do I want to word this um, I mean I don't, did, does everyone agree that we should continue down the path of this bylaw or is it just just something that Rick is feel strongly about or you know I'm, I might say I think it's it's mm -hmm. It's kind of important in the context of you know when, when we look at some of the the sea level rise problems we're facing, and just as a, a general piece of policy, it's I think useful for the community to recognize it, and I'd hope that other communities would you know recognize this you know going into the future, and it's you know good from a policy standpoint to say you know, you know build your house on you know solid ground. You know, yeah, well, it's, it's you accept kind of the simple. risk. I mean, I yeah. think that's the main thing. If people can get permission from the town to build on a seashore, I think they should accept that risk, Bobby, and all that, that's what this is trying to get at. I'm, so. Just another way to look at it, I'm, I'm remembering back to uh, um, around the my comment area, there was a number of houses that were approved and built, and then we got some complaints later on from flooding in those basements, and one of the complaints was, well, we got a approval from the building department, and you know now our houses are being flooded, and you, know, you signed off of it. You need to empty this pond. Well, that's I think that's a risk the homeowner should be cognizant of. And yeah, I I, I guess if you're going to rewrite this thing, it needs to be much clearer than it was last year because it, the article the way it was last year, I couldn't support. Oh, I understand. Um, so I think it's one of the reasons. Uh, you know, I I did not. I initially called the article, and then I undid my call, Bobby, and I had a talk with a couple of citizens and. And I think there were some concerns that we can um, understand and meet and modify the proposal to deal with. So that, that would be my intent. Who's going to write it? Well, I think council wrote the bylaw last year. Um, and I think it, I'd like to have permission to work with him to redraft it in a way that eliminates those problems. So OK. okay. Yeah, I'd like to read it rewritten. Yeah, I'd like to okay. see what it would do. All right, fine. Um, this, okay, yeah. Let's let's get so it rewritten. Let's see what it says and okay. go from there. And I'm not. And, and the question, I'm not sure it would apply to the the, the properties on the pond you're talking about. But that's a different. Yeah, issue. just that's, an example. Yeah, that's I, I, my concern is you know if somebody owns a piece of property on a public way or a county way and they build a home and they get the permits, they go through all the proper process. Um, and then, I, I'm just not clear how this, this whole take your own risk thing is, because suppose the house is a quarter mile down the road from where there's any erosion, and they're ero they have no erosion, but the road washes out behind them, and it's a county road. Are we saying, well, tough now, we're not gonna fix your road? You see what I'm saying? I do. As I recall, this does deal with the road issue, or council, or infrastructure council that's, commented on that. Right. I, that's my concern. I mean, right. if their house is road in the way, and then that's that's one thing. But if they're they're in a situation where they don't have any erosion, but they're serviced by either a town or town or county facility that's damaged by erosion on either side of them, I don't want this bylaw to say basically say you're on your own because you built out here, even though you're not. It's not directly affected. We'll, we'll yeah. deal with that question, Bobby, okay. and find out. I hear you. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of places that are going to no, be built I, I, up I now that I don't, don't have other houses that, that we are going to have the right. responsibility for. But we'd have to see it. You know, but there there are instances like I think of uh, of um, 
happens in Sheep's Pond, yeah, where it's eroding houses. right there in the corner of the road, but there's some houses down the other end that are on the other side that have no issues. So I think the uh, initial draft defined a, a uh, shoreline area going, I believe it was, what, 100 and how many? 150 feet? Anyway, a distance from right. the shore, Bobby. We do have some areas where we have long dirt roads. There are county roads that, you know, the road may erode away, and we I just don't want to say we're not going to fix them because some, somebody's right. I think down. there are different issues here. But okay. We'll deal All right. That's that was okay. the issues that I have with it. Yep. That and the new construction. Okay. So. Um, home rule petition to expand the room occupancy uh, tax to seasonal vacation homes. Um, my, myself personally, I was uh, adamantly against this both times that it came up last time, and I just want you all to know the only way that I would support this at all is if this money. There would have to be a two-pronged thing here. First, the sewerage of Madiket, Shimmel, and Monomoy would have to pass the funding. And then I would want this money earmarked to pay down that debt. But, you know, I don't, I don't know that I mind, um, in this case, having a... Usually I'm reluctant to have a specific use for general tax revenues, which this almost is. But I, I, I recognize, in this case, the local politics in getting votes to support this so that I, I'd be willing to consider a specific use such as the uh, sewer expansion bonds or to the sewer fund in general, Bobby. Or to water quality well, improvements, even what, whatever, more broader. However we but, define that. You know, and I think that might change the, the you know, marginal vote and make it a positive vote. So, Don? Um, I know that this has failed t twice. Um, and my concern, th this could generate a substantial amount of revenue, which could be a really good thing for the town. My concern is the implementation of this, because I think that it could become very unfair if this is put onto the real estate offices to collect this tax, but then all of the people who rent through VRBO and so forth, it's unregulated. I think that if the implementation is going to be a really big concern for people, because I think it needs to be on the homeowner to report it as income and pay the tax themselves and not have the professionals who are doing everything correctly penalized when then people will go rent on their own. If you rent a house on VR, VRBO in Vermont, you pay a 10% tax to the state of Vermont. It, it can be done. So it VRBO. needs to be linked. Right. Um, but... But my feeling on this is, and, and I, as I said, I was adamantly against it both times because I just didn't want it to did feel like it was another tax, is it's two-pronged. One is that all the inns have to pay it, and it's unfair to them. Two is the reason that we have deg uh, degradation in our harbors and ponds is because of all these homes that are used seasonally in these watersheds, and a lot of them are rented. And they... These people that are renting these houses and using them need to pay for clean water. Yeah, they're contributing <laughs> to the problem. They right, can contribute to the solution. If you, if you, I, we've never done this, but if you did, if you went and you tested the water and saw how much nitrogen came in it in December, February, January, February, and then did it in June, July, and August, you'd see it's there's a lot less going in in the winter time when there's. 8,000, 9,000 people here, and there's 75,000 in July and August. And, you know, this is, this tax is, it's not like it's, it's, it's going to come up, it, it's just going to be added on to the rental. It's not going to be, it's, it's not coming out of the, the person's m pocket that's renting the houses. They're not going to drop their rate. They're just going to say a tax. It's no different than the inns. You rent the room for so much a night, and then there's a tax. Right, yeah. I mean, it's it's done in many other places, but it's a matter of how it's collected and that it's done fairly. So That's I, a concern for me. I think we're all happy to collect it the best way possible, right. whatever that is, Dawn. <laughs> um, right? But uh, just, I just want to be clear what the only way I would support this is if it was tied to, to paying down the debt. There does have to be a place where you draw the line in terms of what's what's a vacation rental. Over thir once you get over thirty days, it probably would not apply. Yeah, it'd be, 
Yeah, I, th I think there are enough uh, communities on the Cape. I don't know how many have yep. kept working on this, five or six. And, and I think trying to get a common definition amongst all of those parties would be very important. So I think a rental less we than 60 days. So, yeah. if, if I could just you know, jump in quickly, I did attend about two months ago a um, you know, Cape and Island Selectmen's Association meeting with this being the main subject. Right. And I want to say there was about 90% of the towns in attendance. And uh, there was about one or two towns who were kind of on the fence, but all were in favor of it um, in concept. And I mentioned, you know, kind of the tying of water quality and that we need to be working together on this. Um, and there was a lot of support for that and recognition that we need to work together on it. Um, I think they're even a little more proactive on the Cape in, in getting this enacted. Um, but I, I, I do think um, doing it, you know, holistically and remembering the Airbnb folks and just the vacation re rentalers is important in, in how you draft it, um, you know. Well, Airbnb is out there publicly is saying they'll support these kinds of efforts after San Francisco. So they're, they're, they're on board, just as Bobby said. No, no problem with them. Anyway, so I would suggest we try and get some you know, the, the most common home rule petition that everybody's using, look at it, make sure we understand the variables, 30 days, 60 days, whatever they are, and, and add the use of the proceeds and, and have council help us out. But, you know, just to, just to add into that, Rick, you know, I, I've been, I know it can be kind of challenging working with other, you know, towns that kind of have similar legislation. Is, is there a process, you know, Libby, do we, do we reach out to the Selectmen's Association um, I think that's what that meeting was intended to do is yeah. try to link. Yeah. Th th this has been an ongoing effort for quite a number of years and uh, the idea is to link everybody together and everybody put the home rule petition on their town meeting warrants and some have, some haven't. Right. Um, I mean, I, I I, so is Ed Lewis still the guy? Ed, Ed is still very much engaged. Right. So yep. let's, let's somebody yep. ought to volunteer, you, Bobby, I, me, whoever, to talk to Ed Lewis and, and say, Ed, we want to work together he he's like a voluntary consultant a copy he's, a copy of it he is dedicated to this getting yeah. this done so. and you know I'd, I'd like to volunteer i've been reaching out to a number of the cape communities in regards to our you know kind of our fisheries letter we sent up to the governor and trying to get them to sign on so be more to happy to add that into my you spiel know, this is uh as as don said this is a substantial amount of potential money to the town and um you know, there's other things besides just running pipe to Madigan into these areas in regards to water quality. We have all the storm drain issues. We have the ponds. I mean, this money could be used for all those things. You have gray water, which gray is... Gray water. Which someone came and told me he thinks is a bigger issue than the nitrogen. Cause yeah. Because it, it happens peak season, and it's, so, it's like putting so many hotel rooms right on the water with everybody yeah. doing whatever they do in their hotel room out the window. So, well, gray water is different than black water. Gray water is um, like washing the boats, laundry, and all of the marine industry now. I mean, we talked about the fertilizer regs earlier, and this sort of reminded me of when we had the no discharge zone in the harbor, and we were the first town to implement that regulation. God's got to be 25 years ago now. And we put the dye tablets in the... Uh, holding tanks. So if they pump their holding tank, tank, it put a big orange cloud out around the boat and stained the hull. And everyone said we couldn't do it, and we did it. And guess what? A few people pumped their hulls, their the tanks, and they had big orange stains on the side, and they got <laughs> asked to leave Nantucket Harbor and never come back. And now we pump, well, um, Sheila's not here, but I'm pretty sure she can verify these numbers. I think Nantucket pumps more raw sewage from vessels than any other harbor at one time, we were the highest pumping harbor in the in the country. So you know, there's ways to do these things. Um, gray water, um, the, the the whole boat industry now uses um, environmentally non-phosphate, non-detergent soaps. They make there's a million of them out there. They're citrus based. They don't have the harmful chemicals that they used to have in them. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened in the marine industry to deal with some of these things. Four-stroke engines now and all these things. So, 
but gray water just in general still you know is still an issue you know you've got you've got all kinds of runoff that comes into the harbor from other things um, that you know we could use some of this money to to deal with yeah but you know Bob you just mentioned the, the gray water from boats you know I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that you know some of that the the gray water being pumped out from boats is isn't having an effect on our harbor I well, everything you know, has an effect on that. Right, but I, I just think that's, you know, something to note is, you know, why is, you know, gray water on, on boats a little separate where we have all the town, you know, downtown right on the water is sewered and, you know, or in septic, and a lot of those detergents are caught. You know, if, if no, I have a nice yacht on, on the wharf and I do my laundry with, you know, Tide or whatever, you know, that's gray water. That can be flushed out. And, and I, and There's I, and no holding tanks in the boats for gray water. That's the main thing. It's all plumbed out direct. Exactly. Well, and there's no federal regulation that requires them to do it. So if well, you tried to, if, if you put tried to put a gray water regulation into place, it would be unenforceable. Well, we we, have we one. actually have we, one. we have one um, that hasn't been very well enforced, if at all enforced over the years. Roberto and I talked about it um, very recently, and there is an issue as to, I guess, whether some of these boats have um, a holding tank for gray water, but. Since we have a bylaw, we've talked about how to get it enforced. Do you want to mention quickly how, what we talked about? So we excited we like care so much, Roberto. It, it, it must be uh, <laughs> nice to come to the island. Well, it's, been, it's been nice that I've actually been called up to the microphone so many times today. <laughs> it feels exciting. Um, sorry. Um, we had a gray water, we have a gray water regulation that's actually been in place since the late 80s. Uh, it's been just there and hasn't been enforced. Uh, it may have been enforced at some, t at some time, but it must have been a little hard and fallen by the wayside. So one of the th ideas that we were bouncing around was if we can get agents. Uh, we recently adopted police as agents to the Board of Health so that they can report things to us so that we can ticket for it. Agents like that, we can... Every town official can be an agent to the board. So if they see people pumping, if they see dumping, if they see illegal thing, as long as we can get that report to us with the information of who it is who's pumping it or pumping it illegally, the board can issue a fine. The health department is allowed to issue a fine on that. And on top of that, through from the regulation, the regulation, I believe, explicitly says the fine is $300 per incidence. So... I, I think I'd like to see this regulation mm -hmm. and review it because you're going to tell me if somebody's washing their boat with environmentally, environmentally safe soap, that's considered a violation? It, that's gray water. It, ha it has to be done. The, the way the violation was written or when the violation was written, these environmentally safe products didn't exist. So it's definitely something we would have to revisit. Right. I think we need to really mm -hmm. look at this before we just say we're going to go out there mm -hmm. and enforce it because the other issue is if you, if you know anything about boats, you have bilge pumps that come on. You have air conditioning pumps. Yep. You have cooling pumps. You can't just say to everyone who works for the town, you're a, lic you're, you're a licensee to give out no. a, a ticket because they think something's pumping out of this boat that isn't, you know, no, it's, they, it's they, salt water coming through and cooling and going back out. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're not going to be the issuing authority. The only people who have the, issue, the authority to issue the ticket would be the Board of Health. They just have the authority to be our eyes and ears in case they do see something they can snap a picture of what it is they're seeing or whatever and we can contact that person and see what's happening I know for 20 plus years in the boat basin for example they every boat that comes in there gets a pamphlet as to what they can use that's considered safe and I, and I know back to when I was on shab 30 years ago when we, this whole regulation came into place I thought somewhere we approved certain certain uh, products for Use to wash boats and clean things. I, th um, I think it sounds like a little out of date, and let's get it back I, and review it. You know. Absolutely, that regulation should have been amended at that time. Uh, fact is, it didn't, and we just we we found the regulation recently when the question was brought up. I was going through the old Board of Health regulations, and it's a regulation that's been on the books for almost thirty years. Let's take a look at it. kind of off track there. Sorry, Libby. Well, it's, you know, if, if, if it's in relation to, a, you know, we want to change the bylaw or strengthen it or, or, or adjust it, you know, maybe that's something should go on the, on the warrant for town meeting. I think it's in line with some of the board's goals in regards to water quality. 
Okay, um, I agree. Let's see. Anything else on the warrants? Bobby, one question. Um, I know there's a note someplace in here about the zoning warrant list that was submitted. I, mm -hmm. The one I found was dated September 30, Libby, so I, maybe there's a more recent one. I don't know. I, and my question is, are there, do you know if there are maps? Um, anyway, I'll drop this off for you. Maybe we can... Yep, there, there are. I think. Were there maps with these? Gotcha. Okay. Because you there are a lot of them, and we're, you know, we're going to have a full town meeting if we go with all of these. We, and maybe we should have one night where we just review. We usually do, don't we, Andrew? We we'll have one night where we just go over the, the um, zoning articles. How many are there now, roughly? Ballpark. That's not bad. Do you want to try to do that on the second? Yeah. You don't well, have so, sooner than later. That way, if we have questions, it gives An Andrew ample time to get answers. We're not. Can you do that, later. Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Bobby, just you know, one other thing I wanted to add in. I mentioned, um, I think, at our last meeting, you know, that, um, I think the board would be, our time would be well spent pursuing some takings for some, you know mentioned Fulling Mill, uh, the end of uh, Shimo, Pimney's Point, you know, they're used to, you know, historically public access there. It, it's not exactly clear anymore. There's a number of, you know, private gate signs and, and I've talked to some folks who say, well, there's no public access there anymore, but there's kind of like little private ways. Um, and I think that's something that's important, you know, not only for public safety to have, um, you know, public safety be able to get to those points in the harbor, but also for our public um, to be able to access. You know, in the past we always go through a process of trying to get easements or exchanging with a paper street, but I think in, in some of these cases the, the town should proceed with some takings to protect these, um, these accesses. You know, Matt has talked about, you know, the proprietors, you know, we all have this right to the water and um, in certain areas that's been eroded and I think you know, strong action from the town to take those back should move forward, and I, I think that's something we should have um, roads and right away look at, and um, our new real estate group look over and, and bring forward an article to town meeting because I think that is very important. We have a, a review of we have an, an update from roads and right of ways on. We yeah, it's I mean, you've got some agendas coming up that have a lot on them, and it already time is for something like that running a little bit short to get it on the town meeting warrant with all the information that we would need. We could ask the right-of-way committee to look at, if you give me very specifically what you want to want them to look at, um, you know, the, the history of them and, and what they know about it. But we did ask them, I have talked to the chairman about coming in and reviewing what their projects are going forward and perhaps um, refocusing them a little on stuff like this. Um, but I didn't really have that on for till January. But if you want well, to I think up. I think it's important. I mean, they, they do work for us, so to speak. They're our committee, and their workload and efforts ought to reflect our priorities. And, mm -hmm. you know, access to the water is clearly, to me, a priority. And just asking them... I think we ought to, whether we have to wait till January to dialogue about it, I'm not sure. We're all free to attend their meetings, and Libby, maybe on our behalf you could let them know we are interested in, in access, and here are three examples. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I don't want to put more pressure on Libby to do I'd be glad to go do that. I just yeah. didn't want to operate yeah. outside the I, thoughts I'm, of the board. I think it would, I, first of all, I agree with you 100%. I've seen too many of these go away. and. But I think it would be very difficult to get anything together for this town meeting, given the fact that we we could we'd have to if we're going to do a taking, we'd have to award damages, and we have to figure out where the damages are going to come from, and it may have to be something that has to go in front of capital. So that's that's but, fair but enough. But I think but it would be a good thing to go to and just move forward on the process. Go to roads it's and right away and say term. these three roads are priorities for us. Start doing the research. Find out if they are proprietors' roads or, or, or if they're private and what our rights are to them, if any, and then go from there. So, what were they again? Um, you know, Fulling, Fulling Mill, Mill, 
mm -hmm. um, Pimney's Point mm -hmm. and um, Shimo. There's kind of like a private parking access and the, there's a kind of a vague public access. And okay, where you can identify those spots and there may be others. So let's well, Quidnet Road, for example, used to be one. Right. You used to be able to just go on the beach there and you can't. Is that a driving issue or a public access issue? Both for me, Both. you know. There is public access, yeah. but anyway, we could do, but I, I'm all for public access, Bobby. Don't if, worry. If, if any of you had any thoughts or could, you know, send them to me and, you know, I'll try to put something together and um, relay that on to the roads and right away. I know Libby has lots of other stuff on her plate, so. I, I can, um, maybe I can prep them via email that you may be coming. Great. Warn them. Or anybody, any Warn one them. of us is free to go. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's an open meeting. There are a few of these committees that I think we should start. A little direction is helpful. Right. Okay. Um, since we're still on the warrants and you had to ask about citizen petitions, I have one that I have collecting signatures for that will be going in on Friday that is um, to uh, have term limits on any multi-person board appointed or elected in the town. Three consecutive terms then you'll have to take a year off before you can reapply or rerun for those boards. Just That'll so you know. be an interesting discussion, Bobby. I would have liked to have had the board <laughs> sponsor it, but I felt strongly enough about it that I just went out and got the 10 yeah, signatures. So It'll be a healthy debate. All right. Next is uh, the updates on the encroachments at Cathcart. Back in July, you had some discussion about Cathcart Road, and it wasn't totally about the encroachments. It was more about expanding parking and making sure the access is um, easy for people to get in and out of there and pull off spots and things. So what Kara was asked to do was to obtain a survey to determine exactly where any encroachments may or may not be located and she has done that and can explain that situation. Um, the harbor is at the top and this was done before the um, land bank did the additional parking mm -hmm. in, at their area that provides a good 10 to 12 spaces. I wanted to note that um, originally we had hoped to do some parking in this area here where the roadway um, fans out to the northeast. However, um, after discussing it with Jeff Carlson, that area has um, uh, is a wetlands so that we cannot do any construction there. We have worked with this abutter and this fence on this side has been removed and I did want to note that these fences all have uh, vegetation up to uh, the back of them. We did do clearing in this area which created space for probably another four vehicles. So uh, there is expanded parking. The, um, the vegetation removal was minimal and was concentrated in this area and this area. Bobby or Kara, uh, just to be clear, I think there were two issues. One was parking, but I think another issue was that there were clearly situations, and it sounds like there may still be, where people had built fences on the town property. And are those dotted lines the fences? Yes. Are they still all there? Well, the dotted lines are the edge of the gravel surface. The um, these long lines here, yeah. those are fences. And they're still there. They are still there, okay. except this section is gone. But all, all those other way. ones are still there. Yes. So, so the, all the fence on the right hand side is gone. Yes. So the town property, whether it has. And there were a bunch of bushes planted by the property owner there? Uh, there's a slope that still has some vegetation on it, but the fence is gone. It's kind of uh, on the, uh, I was just down there the other day, but on the right, it kind of, where that turn is, it kind of is a little deeper there, mm -hmm. and there's kind of natural vegetation, and I know the homeowner had planted some 
yeah, non-native vegetation. Further down, there were clearly plantings. Yeah, and those were removed. But on the other side, and, and I don't I don't know exactly where the lot line. You know, I'm not a surveyor. On the other side, you know, I believe there's some clear. In, in, at least I think not having staked through, it out through this area, the fence is on the right of way line. This is very close. This does jut out, and there is a sight distance issue there. And clearly, this is in the right of way. This is on the edge of the right of way, and all of this is gone. How narrow is it right there, Kara? At that right here, yeah. we widened that out so um, a um, a vehicle can get through very easily and tightly two smaller vehicles can get so by each other. So if that fence was gone, we could widen that out a little more and let vehicles Well, we have some grade by. issues that we have to deal with, but um, if we were to cut into the slope and bring it back, we could widen that. It's flat on this side. i got to go. go back out there. So, so is the question, or I don't know if you're posing this as a question. It, it was meant to be an update, and I guess if the board wanted to direct us to have these encroachments removed we would do that I think there was some amount of direction in the at the July meeting to do that but it was unclear exactly where they were or were not okay. yeah I mean I think you, know, you can always make ex exceptions but as a general proposition it seems to be you know property owners should not be putting fences on town property mm -hmm. but it's fairly straightforward I think and when we find that happens, the question is, what do we do about it? We can just let it go if we don't think it's, but eventually, you know, at some point down the road, if you don't do it now, those fences ought to go back on their property, it seems to me. So kind of like edges? Well, edges are uh, maybe the same thing, Bob. I don't know. It seems like that fence on the left hand side. So, like side edges in town, that's a big move deal. Back. Yeah, I mean, my. I mean, uh, this is pretty close to the property line to here. Yeah. That's, that one's pretty close to jogs in now. But this little section right here to here, if that fence went like that, I, granted, I, I'm trying to remember, I think I know what you're talking about, there's a bank there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the puppies. So sort of like bank or no bank. I mean, clearly someone's, what, five feet into our property with a fence? At least. And if the one on the other side's been removed, which you say it has, how is it fair for one property owner on one side to get, say, take your fence down, and we don't right. tell the guy on the other side to take his fence down? Yeah, we, we didn't do any work on the, the, the uh, westerly side. All the work we did was on the easterly side. And is it all, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while since I've been out there. Is that fence, is it in, is the fence on this side, is there all vegetation, is it grown into vegetation, or is it? It's the, pretty, yeah, it's pretty grown yeah. over. See, I'd hate to rip all the vegetation out to get the fence moved back five feet. I, well, I got to drive could, out They could again. pull the fence out and just go jump over the vegetation. I mean, I'm not sure if it's natural or if it's privet or planted or whatever. But it's it's yeah. it's, ve it's very natural and it's wild. Like scrub oak so if it's scrub oak, you could just pick the fence up and move it back, Bobby. You don't have to take it all out necessarily. Yeah, I think if they tried to move it, it would fall apart. It's a very old fence. So we could wait ten years and it'll disintegrate. <laughs> I, I, I it won't take that, that long. You know, I, I I think you know there's there's been a lot of these roads that kind of they kind of get smaller and smaller and it, it never hurts it and especially if the you know property owner you know Bobby's point's well made if the property owner on one side's taking it out I, I don't see any problem with us enforcing saying take it out on the other side that's pretty straightforward you know seems fair to me and then and then that gives us flexibility if you know that becomes the great beach beating spot and we want to improve that road and and cobble it the whole way down there and people can take their <laughs> horse carts and go swimming, we he's, can do that. and We don't have to move cobbles. any fences. It's okay, we'll notify the abutter on the, the westerly side. Thank you. Um, activities, Libby? So just some highlights of what we've been working on the last month or so. We've had in the personnel category, some various grievance and disciplinary actions. We have hired our assistant finance director, who is Linnell Vollins. A number of different meetings, I won't go through every single one of them, but they related to special town meetings, capital 
department heads, events, 4th of July prep, you will have an item at your next meeting about 4th of July. It was a seasonal housing forum. Fast Ferry Connector funding was a meeting, audit committee. Um, projects, we are continuing to work on the tank farm relocation with Harbor Fuel, and we have a meeting um, coming up about that. The Children's Beach concession renovation, I sort of talked about that a little bit earlier, the new municipal building, 4FG housing, the fire station is getting ready to get underway. We are in the middle of an IT operational review. We had funding for a visitor services operational review, but nobody really bid on it or it wasn't a viable vendor. So we're sort of shelved that just for the time being. Hummock Pond Road bike path extension or the Milk Street bike path extension. The fiscal 17 budget, I'm trying to really carve out time um, to work on the presentation for you. 2016 annual town meeting prep. Um, we spent some time on the school construction staging area. There was a 40B workshop, worked on a couple of e-newsletters. The special town meeting, of course, took up quite a bit of time. Um, closing on the FAA Madiket property. We had a really nice employee appreciation event at the VFW, the Our Island Home Forum, and various issues associated with Our Island Home. And I need to get on top of the sewer projects funding and the public outreach um, uh, Woodard and Karn is going to start working on a newsletter. That'll be our step number one. And that's the tip of the iceberg. Several, several Isle Island home forums and relocation of the tank farm. I'll throw that one in there. Yeah. And I just wanted to say that you, I went to the employee appreciation event, and it was an excellent event, well done by you and your staff. Uh, that is all attributable to our NEAT group, the, what's it called, what is it name again? Mm -hmm. Nantucket Employee Empowerment Team. Yes, they did a fa fabulous job. Food was good, yeah. Atmosphere was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Really fun. I got to give out a bunch of pins, 35-year pin, yep. I think it was. Wow. Yep. That's it for town manager's report, Mr. Chairman. All right. That moves on to selections reports and comments. Uh, we've already done the health the adoption of the Health Maintenance Organization, or HMO. Uh, the next is to, um, an action is needed to designate the Real Estate Assessment Committee, the newly formed Real Estate Assessment Committee, as special municipal employees so that they can represent clients in front of other boards in the town. So I will entertain a motion to do so. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and then there's a discussion regarding the comments on the Department of Public Utilities and the proposed national grid rate increase. Now, according to Libby, um, Lauren has looked this over and so has <coughs> Dave Fredericks and they feel that there's really nothing that we need to comment on it about. It's, um, pr it's for improvements that national grid will make on Nantucket. Did I get that right, Libby? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So these are distribution costs? Is that what I saw? It will be, a, yeah, exactly. So um, if anybody has anything to add or questions, no. feel free. But the, the one thing is that the comment letter needs to go in within a week, I think. There's a public hearing on the 30th, and they wanted all comments in before that. So if we're going to be preparing any, we need to get on it. No, I, you know, I, I just saw an email going around. Um, you know, I, I thought this was something we should comment on, you know, kind of that was prior to reading the details, but I do think it's important that we kind of let the DPU know that you know, we do have some energy concerns and sometimes, and, and costs, and sometimes even these little things are a good mechanism for saying, you know, hey, we're, we're doing our best over here, um, but. You know. We'll note, we haven't had a rate increase in six years, so. No, I, I understand, but I think, I think it's important, you know, to, you know, sometimes these DPUs can, you know, operate very closely with the utilities, and I think it's important to say, you know, when we when we talk about rate heights in regards to other cables, you know, that are that are, that are kind of mandates for the communities to pay, and they're, they're you know, tens of millions of dollars, and th you know, this is just you know, you, you start laying out your case now, um, you know, where you want to go as a community. Um, so, I have a question when. Uh when Lauren or Dave looked at it, did, what were the bill impacts for commercial industrial? Did they look into that at all? Or? 
Because in, in the in the letter it says bill impacts for commercial and industrial customers will vary. These customers should contact the company for specific bill impact information. Because R1 and R2 was specified and the commercial wasn't. I, d I don't know. No, we don't. Okay. Must be a formula. I, I don't know. That's, yeah. I mean, but, kind of but, but those are, you know, Matt, you know, I bring it up because, you know, a lot of times as a community, we don't, we're not really engaged in this process. You know, it kind of happens up at the state, but I think it is important for us to, you know, maybe, you know, raise that as a, as a con as a concern, you know, we're we're concerned about commercial rates, or you know, there's it, it just never hurts to s to s to start your relationship with the DPU, and you know, if if Dave and Lauren don't think it's necessary, so be it. But like, no, no, yeah, but I, yeah, I'm, yeah, let me say it. I agree completely with you, but but then the question, you know, you've asked questions and you don't know if they've been, you know, they probably have been answered. It probably was looked at. Yeah. But that, that's all I'm saying. So we might be saying, now oh, we don't need to comment, but if they're, you know, have a 10% hike on commercial industrial, we could have a lot of people pretty mad at us for not looking into it and commenting. And I'm not saying that's what the case is here. I don't know what the case is. Yeah. So uh, that's just a comment. Yeah, you know, and yeah. would there be a big problem in asking Lauren to, you know, draft a letter that says, you know, the board is concerned about, you know, mounting costs in a number of different areas for our community and, and energy is one of them. and. Um, we understand that there hasn't been a rate height in six years, but we, you know, like to keep in mind, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, and you know, we thank the DPU for their thoughts. So, um, something to that effect, you know. I, Lauren has I a better. I wonder if anything that vague is going to have any impact on it. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know the the best way to sort of lobby the the department. I'm I'm not sure Tobias yet. So we don't have a lobbyist. So. Yeah, I think we we do. I think it's Mr. Madden and Mr. Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. They yeah. they have to weigh in. The, these folks work in effect on, on budgets, and so there are ways they can influence the process. So th that may be more effective. I'm not sure. So. I kind of agree. I think that you know it's got to get through them. <coughs> Excuse me. It's got to get through them. I. You know, we can make a comment letter, but it's something that general. If we don't have one specific thing or another in here to uh, to well, really pound on, I don't know if it's going to have much effect. You know, I mean, just to say we're concerned about the potential for a third cable and and cost increases to our consumers. I'm sure there's they're concerned about that as well. So, well, not necessarily. You know, it 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 helps to always remind. You know, there there's a lot of other project that they're much more focused on than Nantucket and a little rate increase. This would just be like us <coughs> signing off a, you know, a, a new name for a street, you know, bada bing, you know, but for us it's important. So, I'm, you know, if, if, if Lauren and Dave are satisfied with it, I'm, I'm fine, but I, I think it's important we have a discussion about it at least. Yeah. It, it, it might be helpful to all of us and, and if but Lauren could let us know what those improvements are that we're being asked to pay for. Not so much in terms of a letter, but I am just a little bit curious now. Are they new lines? I'm sort of wondering what, what they are. I, th I think th they have to do with the um, generation at Bunker Road. The, the generation at Bunker Road. So these are backup uh, generators or the infrastructure to go with them? I believe so, okay. but she could certainly look into it a little bit. Well, that's right. If that's what it is. I mean, to me, that's probably something we we appreciate and are thankful we have. Mm -hmm. And if it costs a little bit of money in our rates, I'm, I'm not sure I would object to that. So yeah. might find a better vehicle, Tobias, is, is my thought. And I think if That's we're fine. concerned about a cable, I think it doesn't hurt to, you know, at some point ask Lauren to draft a separate letter to be sent by the board to them and say, look, we are concerned about this, and send it to Mr. Madden and Mr. Wolf and to the department and to the executive part of the state government and let them know we care so great okay that brings us to committee reports I have zero I have one go ahead Don um, the CPC finished this morning their draft of the warrant articles as far as what projects are 
proposed to be funded. So that was great. And um, the chairman of the CPC very specifically asked me to thank Brian for um, for all of his work and that it's it's been a real pleasure for him to work with you um, from a CPC perspective. How many projects and roughly how much money? <laughs> Just a night ballpark. Um, the money was just let me see, let me pull it up for you. Okay. It's usually around two <laughs> could, million. Come back to me in a moment. A little north or south of two million. Yeah, it's a little north of two million. But I can I'll tell you how many projects I've got it here. Did Mr. Tour bring up the uh, comment he made at the uh, housing forum the other Saturday uh, about asking CPC for funds for a uh, clearing house project? If that's the right phrase. Um, Do you remember that? Not during the deliberations okay. for who was getting funding. While you're looking it up, I just will make a note. I mentioned this to Rick and Libby earlier, but um, in the Cape Cod Times this week, there was an article that I believe it was Sandwich, Rick? Sandwich. Sandwich yep. used a little over $600,000 of community funds for a beach nourishment project on one of their public beaches. And Bobby, I think that was on top of a million dollars. Right. So right. The, a lot of money yeah. has come out of their... Right. Fund and it went through their town, their special town meeting with not even a call. So just amazing. It was interesting. I never thought of ever using CPC funds for erosion control, but it's a public beach and it's very important to them and their yeah. economy, and they're doing everything they can to mm -hmm. keep it. There's plenty of beach, you know. I went over and checked it out. It seemed like there was lots of beach. In Sandwich, where yeah. they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to be interesting. They got a few storms and. We'll see what happens. This isn't yeah. the second time, too, I believe they've done it. In terms of uh, building up the beach? Yeah, and, and using CPC funds. I think it might be the second time. Well, that done. could be. I missed that, yeah. Mm. I'm not sure on that. I thought someone said that. Yeah. Uh, why, Don's looking at it. Do we have any other committee reports? No. Mm. All um, right. Don, don't worry about it. 14. 14. Was there, uh, it, well, just curious, one last question. Was there any for open space? Or did you bank that money? There was, most of it got banked. There was one request for open space. And looking at this, I believe it did get funded. I missed the final meeting this morning. Yeah, it's been the one area that um, So there's when I was on CPC, and I'm sure you're yep. aware of, there's less, you know, part of the CPC regulation, I think it's 10%. Is it 10%. 10% has to go to... 10% has to go to open space, 10% has to go to housing, 10% has to go to historical preservation, and then the rest can be used in any means. Right. And uh, when I was on CPC, we had, at one, I think at that point we had, don't quote me on this number, but I think it was around $800,000 in the bank, the, the land but bank. But you had to allocate some right. time. And we used it, uh, we used a good portion of it for the FAA property with the land council. So yeah. it was, um, it was, good to, it was sort of good to have that bank because these big pieces come up, you want to have a little nest egg to get at it. Yeah. Just um, one committee report on the uh, capital programs we met this morning. We went over the uh, school and the water company. Um, you know, I think it, you know, just kind of two things I took away from it is, one, the water company is going to be replacing a number of mains in the coming years, um, you know, over the next you know, four or five years, and those are can be of a significant cost. Um, you know, so... You know, ratepayers are going to have to be aware of that. Um, and then, you know, kind of another thing that came to light was, you know, in discussions about the school and so, some of their requests for um, funds for repairing their building um, moving forward. Um, you know, it really hammered home to me, you know, kind of some of Matt's comments last week. We were talking about um, the new fire station in regards, you know, when you, you know, these, these buildings are costing us a significant amount of money to maintain going forward. Um, you know, you're having to replace a lot of things, and, and I think, you know, in a, in a funny way, you know, we kind of save money by putting in a little extra money to make them out of masonry, you know. It does seem to kind of save money. It's, there's a lot of rot on these buildings. You know, it's, it's, well, it's they stunning. Were, they were just talking about the nails. Oh, we wouldn't be able to afford stainless nails. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's just funny. Stainless yeah. nails are very expensive. Yeah, I understand that. Copper versus galvanized, drip edge, things like that that you, you spend the extra money on now, you save later. Yeah. If I may, I, I should have asked to speak a little earlier. You mentioned the neat uh, uh, affair that was at the VFW. 
There's another one coming up on December 17th, Thursday at Cisco. And I just want to let you know the employees do a tremendous job. What they're doing is they're collecting goods uh, for the elderly at this event. The last time it was for either the food pantry or food bank. So just wanted to make sure the uh, Board of Selectmen are aware of that. Thanks, Tom. 17th at? 17th at 5 o'clock. At Cisco? Cisco. Great. It's a fun, it's a relaxed, casual atmosphere. I urge any of you members to go. They, it's a good way to get to meet our employees. With that, right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. See you in two weeks. Have a nice Thanksgiving.